Thanks for joining me, Astrid. Nice to see you, friend. Yes, likewise. So hmm, I want to start just by talking a little bit about this first question that I ask everyone. I ask everyone about their life story. And for me, this whole conversation is a, almost a chance to like paint a portrait of who someone is. Um, I also make visual art, obviously, and that's a way to visually represent through who someone is. But this is a way to show through conversation, really get a sense of who someone is and their, almost their soul or their character or what their life has been about. Um, not unlike not unlike like a memoir or a biography or an autobiography or something like that, where you really, you read a book and you're like, oh, I think I have some sense of who this person is and their character and, you know, the struggles they've been through or the challenges that they had or the successes they had in their life or what their goals or desires were and uh, their personality and, you know, their fears or what have you. Like, I love, I love reading memoirs or biographies for that reason. And um, this podcast kind of gets me a chance to get the same quality, both, both with, you know, the biographical details of someone's life, but also um, what they're currently interested in or what, what their soul is drawing them towards too. And um, for that reason, I really like to start with this question of just getting on the same page of, you know, what has happened in your life so far? What's, what have, what have you been on about? And I have, I have reason to think you have a very interesting life story. So I would love to ask you this question and um, about, you know, what's happened to you so far and what you've been through and how you make sense of your own life. And for that reason, there's there's really no right or wrong way to answer. Um, I would love to hear anything you would love to share about yourself and your life and what you've been through so far. God bless you for your framing. <laughs> I love the way that you frame your questions, Sasha. I So let's see, I was born into a family of very religious, um, conservative Christian parents. Um, I spent the first, I'd say, 14 years of my life really enmeshing myself in that culture and those values uh, that I was born into. And we were also like logistically moving all around all of the time. Uh, a lot of people ask me when they hear how many places I've moved, if we were in a military family or uh, what. And no, not until later. We just were very poor, dirt poor, uh, to give you a sense uh for the first like all of my earliest memories are around money and uh this is probably a theme that will come up later the lack of it and uh, there are several moments i remember of at the end of a week or a couple of weeks span my parents coming and bringing out envelopes and writing labels on what they were and literally separating out their cash and saying okay this is how much we can spend on gas this month or this week this is how much we're uh, going to put away in savings. This is how much is going to go to these bills. This is how much is going to go to this bill. And then at the end of the week, there was always like about $10 left over <laughs> or sometimes not. Um, and so everything about our budget was completely fixed uh, for a period of over a couple of years. I remember eating the same thing. For, we had a day that was dedicated to a specific uh, food item for that whole day every week for like years. Um, and if you were hungry and didn't matter, like it wasn't time to eat yet because there wasn't food to eat and we had only apportioned, you know, today it was top ramen for lunch or or it was peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch or dinner was hamburger helper. And that was all you got. And that was the, the budget that we had. And um, so living in a, a trailer park uh, and having that kind of budget uh, our one splurge, uh, weekly splurge was Blockbusters, which used to be a video rental store in the U.S. that was uh, quite large until Netflix decided to change that industry forever. <laughs> uh, they, Net Blockbuster used to have a deal where on Tuesdays you could spend $3 and get a, a large soda and a popcorn and a movie. And that was our consistently the thing that like I agreed with my mom, yes, let's get a movie. And we'd had a movie night and that was our... Uh, weekly splurge and that really didn't start changing until I was uh, in double digits age uh, at that point my parents bought a house my dad uh, started uh, going back to school to get his master's in computer science and he was he's, he's always been a careerist uh, for my younger years and so that was part of the job hopping around of following my dad from 
minimum wage to slightly less minimum wage to managing minimum wage people to uh, developing a new skill set to developing a another new skill set and just like constantly trying to improve himself and myself and my three younger sisters lives um and throughout that process my mom also because of the conservative christian values uh she wanted to instill in us was really committed to homeschooling us and so i was consider this one of the like great blessings of my life that i uh was raised by two parents and the i was homeschooled all the way through uh and because of that i still feel a, like learning and and curiosity are have been the things that have driven me my whole life uh, and i still feel like i'm in school like <laughs> the world is uh constantly a place to learn from and other people are uh, and that was always encouraged in me and whenever i developed an interest in something my mom would do whatever she could to find people who knew things about that more than she did and and bring them into my life and um just gave me like every opportunity to learn uh and that was amazing and so that at one point uh when, by the time i was around 8 years old uh, one thing that my mom said i was going to learn i had to learn was music uh, so I actually started when I was six. Uh, she said, you get to pick the instrument, but you have to learn music. And so I started with uh, flute because I wanted to learn piccolo and she couldn't find a, pic a piccolo teacher to me uh, unless I had already had like several years of experience on the flute. And uh, so I started with the flute and I hated it and I complained every day and I didn't want to practice <laughs> as, as you want might imagine when uh, you're trying to do something you don't want to do, it is a little difficult. And then at eight, uh, my sister would have just turned uh, six. So she had to start at the same time I did. She picked piano and she started playing uh, piano. And I, my mom said, well, you've hated flute. So you're going to learn piano now too. <laughs> so instead of going to two different teachers, you're going to go to the same teacher. This is way easier for me. And so I started learning piano at eight and I hated it and I hated it and I hated it. And then... One day I woke up and I didn't hate it. And I couldn't turn the life of you tell you what the difference was on that day versus the day prior. Uh, but suddenly it was not difficult to practice. I had a sense of like, I was still very, very awful, <laughs> but I had this internal sense of mastery and um, pride in like my ability to play. Uh, I remember there was one Christmas we had just, uh, we're getting ready just before Christmas. We're setting up these decorations. Um, my mom was always a, super into Christmas, but hated putting up decorations. But myself and my sisters always loved putting up the decorations. So we put up the decorations. And one of the decorations was a music box. And it plays, um, I think it was the first Noel or something. It was a, a, a popular Christmas song starts playing on the music box and I, I hear it play and I sit down at the piano and then I play it. And my mom, like her jaw was on the floor. She's like, what, what just happened? <laughs> and literally in that moment, she says, you have to do this for another five years <laughs> um, because you're good at this. And uh, I don't want that to go to waste or something. I don't remember what her exact words, but she definitely said, you have to do this for another five years. And then in five years, you can decide whether this is a thing you continue or at th that point you can, you can stop. And I did it for another five years and then I kept going. And um, by the time I was uh, 15, 16, I, I pretty much was under the assumption that I was gonna be doing music as a career for the rest of my life. Um, I applied to the Berkeley School of Music and they accepted me and then the letter of acceptance came with at the bottom of the price of tuition and I realized that I could buy two houses for the price of tuition <laughs> and went, do I really need to go to this college? Maybe this is a, not a thing that I need to do. And at that moment in my brain, I mentally wrote off uni university at all because it was just like unreasonably expensive to me. Uh, simultaneously to this, I, at this point, would have been about uh, 16. Uh, we, at the time, are living in Germany. 
my dad really wanted to live in Germany. And so he got a job in Germany and we moved to Germany. Uh, we, uh, incidentally, the first time that we moved was only for a few months. And then we it didn't work out with his job. So we moved back to the States and then a year later moved back to Germany again. So now we're in Germany for the second time. I, I've, I'm still under the assumption that I'm going to do something with music for a career. And at this point, rather than just being passively kind of absorbing the culture and values around me, I'm actively pursuing them and uh, thinking that like I'm in alignment with these uh, values and belief system. And I got really into learning about the early church and uh, early Judaism and trying to figure out what was true and what was knowable about this thing that I uh, believed was literal verbatim, like the instructions for how to live a good life and studied it. And at the time I had, I had uh, a girlfriend who we would have, she would call me every night and instead of having a normal, like what I imagined a normal boyfriend, girlfriend conversation being like, it was a prayer followed by study, followed by prayer <laughs> for over an hour every single day. And that was normal in my life. And uh, I started leading a worship band. I started teaching music lessons to people that were uh, in the, involved in a youth group. Um, and then I started, I picked up in addition to, to piano, I picked up guitar and singing as well and yeah that was that was my life and then I started studying at, in this process of studying and and learning more the more I learned the more I came up with questions rather than answers of like well this doesn't make sense and this doesn't square and if I believe this is true and and eventually I got to a point where I realized if I didn't start from the assumption that I this was true and how do I prove it that I couldn't demonstrate a lot of my foundational beliefs uh, were true to other people. And that led me to a kind of a identity crisis. And the results of that identity crisis was me telling my youth pastor, hey, I'm going to stop praying in public. And him asking me, what's that about? And and that then that conversation leading to, yeah, it's probably better if you just quit. Um, and then my world became, how do I make sense of myself as a person? Who am I? What do I value? What am I doing with my life? Where am I going? Because I was under the assumption I was going to do music and like be a, some kind of leader and evangelical sense. Uh, I felt like that was my purpose. And then well, now what do I do? Now I don't have a purpose. And so it was like pushing a big reset on my myself. Uh, not just from a values standpoint, but also personally. And over the course of the next two, three years, trying to figure out who I was and what my values were became a really big focus for me. Uh, so I moved out at the age of 19 to go back to the States. Um, this would have been 2011. So we were just after great financial crisis. Uh, jobs are still pretty scarce. So I ended up working a minimum wage job at the Olive Garden as a host, because that was the only job that I got hired for after months of looking. Uh, made my way through that uh, restaurant career path uh, over the course of the next uh, five years buffed around all over the place, um, both career wise and personally and, uh, location wise. So I've lived all over the U S at this point, uh, I've worked just about every job <laughs> that existed until about 2015. Uh, and in 2015, I got involved incidentally through, uh, it got involved in politics and did a political thing, which is very common, which is pre lying for political gain. Uh, and my lying for political gain went viral and then left me with a lot of decisions to make about how I was going to live my life in, as a consequence of that and chose to live my life in 
embracing the new advertised me that I had created in my head as a political uh, thing. And that was a, uh, an odd way to live that most, most people would probably not choose, but I thought it was fun. <laughs> um, I would not make the same choice again today, but I'm a different person now. I, as a direct consequence of that, over the next a uh, few months, I'd say about six months later, I end up kidnapped, uh, trafficked to New York. I, my life savings at that point of about $50,000 is stolen from me over the course of a month. And then I find myself homeless and living on the street in Harlem uh, during the coldest winter in on record in New York at the time. And that was an adventure. <laughs> and... Uh, so from there, eventually find my way to uh, back to the West Coast, staying on various friends' couches, end up uh, living with some friends in Arizona, watch them go through a divorce, went, went to live with friends in Oregon, watch that house that I was group house a part of fall apart after somebody got a boyfriend and moved out without telling anybody and nobody else could afford to cover their rent. and then went stay with another person on their couch and then started back at the minimum wage job thing again <laughs> by like 2016. Um, so then 2016, I'm going from minimum wage job to slightly minimum wage. I'm like, I've done this before, you know, like <laughs> with the deja vu happening. Uh, by 2017, I'm finally recovered enough from the, the shenaniganry that I lived through in 2015 uh to have presence of mind and go okay it's time to have this conversation again that you had back in 2011 of who are you and what's important to you and what are you going to do with your life and i started i developed this habit of uh, self-reflection and doing this check-in regularly rather than when, when i'm in crisis and that has served me incredibly well and basically in 2017 scoped out what is my life going to look like for the next year three years five years where am I going to be if I actually do that in five years and uh, that process has led me to a bunch of places that I didn't expect uh, but literally I have still have my notes from the first time that I did this process back in 2017 one of the things was I'm going to live in LA by uh, 2022 uh, here I am I was a year late but I did it I uh, I'm going to be working in the entertainment world. Again, here I am. Um, and the perhaps more critically, all of the value statements of who is the, the person that exists like five years from now, what are what are their values? What do people say about them? Those I'm much more proud of that like I can say are uh, changes that are pretty fundamental to my character and uh, as a result, my, as a consequence, my reputation and the the way that I live my life and the way that I even just talk to people is totally different. And I have almost no relationship to the person, the me that was in like 2015, 2016. And it feels weird remembering things and feeling no emotional connection to the person that made those choices because they're so different from the me that it exists now. Uh, and that brings us mostly to today i'd say wow what a wild ride <laughs> uh let's see um when you were a child and you were in the thick of this religious worldview what was that like for you yeah. uh hmm. how do i answer this question I didn't think anything of it was the normal. It was the it was the water I swam in. Uh I enjoyed it a lot. Uh I was surrounded by a group of people who I believed loved me and cared about me and were always looking out for my best interests. And people that were uh served as mentors to me that were nothing but encouraging and supportive and caring and kind and I again like feel incredibly blessed to have the childhood that I did there were uh 
I was surrounded by people and got to interact again as a homeschool kid with people that were everything from infants to people in their 30s. And there was no, from my point of view, like all the way through that, I didn't feel like there was a, a hierarchy of these people are better than me or smarter than me or look down on me. And similarly, I didn't have that perspective about the people below me. Um, whereas a lot of the, whenever I kind of left that community, a place that I felt at home in, I very much felt the the view that there's a social hierarchy everywhere and everybody knows their place in it and has to defer to the people above them and, um, and looks down on the people below them. And that felt completely alien to me and it still does. And, uh, I consider that a, one of the great blessings of the, the way that I was brought up. What did you love about it at the time? Friends. I I had an ever, I had friends who I had known my entire life, uh, well, not my entire life, but for a decade. Um, this, the people that showed up for my eighth birthday party were the same people that showed up for my 14th birthday party. And we all knew each other. We all got along. There was no uh, long-term interpersonal conflict things or friendship ruptures. It was very stable and consistent. Um, yeah. When 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 uh, other folks that I talked to that they, they grew up in a similar background to talk about it, they'd talk about things being constantly in flux or ex, uh, extreme emotions or relationships falling apart. And that was not my experience. Um, yeah, so it was very stable and loving and predictable and yeah, I have, I have almost nothing bad to say about it. <laughs> what kinds of things were you interested in when you were doing homeschooling? Ooh, my first interest was, what was it? Alligators. And that went to a broader, uh, expanded interest to uh amphibians and uh then then that uh eventually came to include like on the other side we went to uh turtles at one point uh and i ended up getting a turtle uh that i got was blessed to take care of for more than a decade <laughs> um and what was what was my next interest then i really fell in love with science fiction um, and so I read a lot of classic foundational science fiction stuff, Jules Verne. Um, ac actually reading, I would say is my first, uh, love and passion. And I, my mom literally several times a year, boxes would arrive full of books and I would just get it. We, the book day would happen. I would just get, we just get this box of books and I would read three books in a night <laughs> and the, whatever seemed most exciting to me. And uh, my mom didn't really care. Like there, she had a, a curriculum and structure of these books. You need to be reading these chapters, these were days, but I was always so far ahead in the reading or doing so much above and beyond that it never really mattered. Um, and so I've at this point, by the time I was 14, I would say I'd pretty much read the entirety of the Western canon, whether it's Plato, Aristotle, uh, Socrates, all of the foundational um, works of, of the Western canon, both uh, fiction and nonfiction. Um, and that was the, those were the memes that I was swimming in, uh, in addition to this community that I uh, was surrounded with, with people that had a similar religious uh and interpersonal values uh yeah i really liked i really fell in love with history early and i felt found real stories about real people and, and things endlessly fascinating and i would just drink it i just i would like for years i would be sleep deprived because every night I would go to bed and then spend the next four hours reading <laughs> <laughs> What sense do you make of this arc that you described where, you know, your mom sort of made you learn an instrument and was first oh. it was flute and 
piano and at first you sort of hated doing it and you were like forced to do it and then later on you loved it like do you make any sense of that um what's the word i think i the things that i love are very much the things that i enjoy sucking at now <laughs> presently i enjoy the process of failure <laughs> um and that the learning to love the process of failure is a skill, I think. And I did not have that skill. I had no relationship or conception of that as a skill. In my in my brain, like me as a six-year-old, there's the things that I want to do and there's the things that I don't want to do. Um, and learning to play the flute was not a thing that I wanted to do. <laughs> I didn't care. Um, I wasn't engaged with it. By the time uh, when I was playing the piano, I got to a, a point where maybe it was because of the way that I was being taught the method of piano. It's called Suzuki. If uh, It's very popular for um, uh, in Japan for uh, violin players. And its focus is mostly on training your ear and relative pitches and developing like an auditory memory and muscle memory rather than focusing on reading sheet music. And that was much more engaging to me. It was much more natural to me. Uh, I remember like the first uh, it's book in Suzuki, you're basically learning Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and, and there's variations of it. And I learned all of the first five variations in a matter of like a couple of days, uh, whereas other people that I saw that were also in a similar place and starting to go through it would take like weeks to get through that. And it was just a like something clicked in my brain um, that that was engaging to me and easy. And uh, the 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 framing was different. The my relationship with the teacher was different. Um, and then this moment, this transition from this being a thing that I dread to this being a thing that I can't get enough of, uh, in my, like, even reflecting on it now, it still feels like it was a big, like, no, this was a, a one day it happened, but I'm sure that it was a much more gradual process than that, that I just didn't notice hmm. at the time. How do you think someone could learn this skill of enjoying sucking at something? Ooh, great question. That is a great question. Um, I want I want to ask. I feel like I, anything that I say is going to be so general as to not be useful. Uh, if you want after this call or at the end, maybe we can. I can if you if you're genuinely asking for yourself, mm -hmm. then we can do a, a a back and forth, and we can uh, maybe I'll be able to give you a more useful answer. Hmm. Do you have a memory of how you learned that? Like what that was like? Yeah, it's uh, most it's it's a it's a shift in my own beliefs about the world and myself that happened. Uh, and this is a I mean, how old am I now? Thirty something. This is much more recent. Uh, so this would have happened in my 20s. I believed things about the world where, uh, like, what, how, how would I exactly frame this belief? Oh, okay. One, I believed that talent or ability was largely innate. Now I don't believe that that's true. I believe that all talent is, uh, talent is a myth. Uh, that it's all work and the people who enjoy the work are the people who we call talented um the and and perhaps like starting in fact almost the exact opposite i almost believe that it's much more plausible to me that starting from a place of being naturally good at, or like faster at learning the beginning process of a thing is actually a handicap because then you get you you learn all the wrong habits and it takes a really long time to unlearn them of um and the the habit of uh 
and skill of being in love with sucking <laughs> and the process of grueling through the boring basics is the thing that propels you to levels that are so much more difficult if you have start with the opposite habit and reward system. Um, so the, 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 the fundamental belief in me that's changed though is yeah, I don't believe talent's innate. Um, now I believe it's earned. I believe I deserve it, that I deserve the uh, greatness. Uh, I didn't believe that I deserved greatness before. Uh, I had a very poor view of myself and my own self-worth. Um, and I, what's the word? Uh, I believe that I am in control of myself and the universe. Um, that the, the, the things that happen in my life are happening because of me, that I'm in control at all times. Um, and so if something is difficult, it's because of a past choice that I've made already. Um, and I'm like, essentially every moment that I live is a, my experience in that moment is a direct consequence of all the choices that I've made before. And if I want to avoid being in a similar position, then, which I would really enjoy being not in the same position of things being difficult, then I have to build those, the habits and make the choices that lead me to that place now. And that framing is a totally, uh, almost an inverse of the, the beliefs that I had about myself and the world um, prior. And that just naturally leads me to this constant, like up and to the right personally of I'm always getting better at things. How people ask you, how are you always getting? I don't know. I just do things so that I will get better at things. And it becomes this like self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, yeah. When you're doing something that's hard these days, when you're putting in the work at something that you want to get better at, what's your experience of enjoying that? Like, Oh, wow. Uh, that's another great question. Um, I love it. And now it's almost confusing to me when other people don't love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I mean, at work for this example, people call me a workaholic, which maybe <laughs> that's a word you could use. Um, but I, I will encounter a hard problem. And instead of experiencing any emotion of like, oh, that's too bad. I experience the exact opposite. I go, ooh, wait. <laughs> this is a hard problem you mean like you don't you know the answer i don't immediately have an answer like oh this is so cool i get to do something new and novel and uh okay what are all of the skills that i'm missing as to be able to understand this problem and and actually solve it and and um i end up working overtime all the time and as a choice not like a thing that anybody's forcing on me and i love it and i just get enthralled in the uh and um uh, presence presence is another thing that it's just like uh whenever i encounter something difficult there's this uh kind of bubble that just i become so engrossed in the thing that the the everything else disappears and i'm fully present and engaged and uh uh it's a full mind mind body out of body experience i don't know mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, this is not, this is not, a, this would be, uh, make no sense to me eight years ago. <laughs> As you sort of had your first identity crisis and you were mm. like, maybe not believing in God or the Bible anymore or something, uh, yeah. what was the worldview that you started to move towards in the first couple of years after that? Oh, I didn't, I didn't know how to put a words to it. Uh, mm -hmm. and let's see. I, if, I think if you ask this question to my parents, they would say, I am an atheist. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't, I don't believe that's true. I don't think that's an appropriate label, but the, when you're, when you start with a foundational belief that there is a singular God who listens to and answers prayer who created the world in seven literal earth days uh and then then you go to a world where well actually the the, the earth and the living things on it went through a period series of gradual adaptation and evolution uh and an idea of god that is 
uh, much more divorced from that. Like any movement away away from this seems like a uh well like atheism. I don't know. Uh, and and very much like the at the time I was putting myself in the mindset of a okay if I can't assume this is true, what's the default? And the default is seems seems to me obviously to be non belief. And so you start from non belief, and where where can you get yourself to? Um, and so the atheism, if depending on its framing or agnosticism, seemed like uh, could have meaning in that uh, sense. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about this series of events that happened where you like uh, got into politics and then like there was yeah. this lie and then you got kidnapped and stuff. <laughs> what, what was the political view that you got into and what was this lie? Like, can you say more about that? Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had a feeling you were going to ask about this. Yeah. So when the, the politics, I got involved in um, two, two, two kinds of politics that fell into this third. Uh, one of them was animal rights activism, um, and the other was uh, libertarianism, which for folks outside of the U.S., this would be called like classical liberalism. Uh, the idea is that you have the right to make decisions about your own life uh, and your relationships to other people. So that involves who, to, what to buy and from whom, um, in what degree and when and where and the terms and uh, you be, should be allowed control of your own life, or rather you do have control over your body and therefore you have control over uh, your actions and, and you have ownership over your actions in your life. Uh, and extending this into the political realm, you end up with a like, okay, well then how do we justify taxes or or uh police who say no you're not allowed to do that thing and like well i'm a lot i have the ability to make that choice and therefore don't i have the right to make that choice and um that's that's where you end up in with political libertarianism so i i became active in this scene uh and through that scene started paying attention to uh politics a lot more than i once did which was zero before this <laughs> and that I found a group that uh, was reading old books, uh, old dense history books, which is the kind of people that I love. And we had a biweekly meeting where we'd just get together. We'd read some old history book on something like money and banking in the U.S. Uh, and we'd get together and then we'd talk about it. And, and then we'd eat pizza and we'd hang out for a couple of hours and... I hung out with those folks for months. And at one point, one of the things that came up in conversation afterwards was, hey, have you guys seen this local thing that's happening? And uh, at the time I was living in Boise, Idaho, and this local thing that they were referring to is uh, called itself Add the Words. And these were, this was a political group that had been around at this point uh, for about 10 years. And it was a group of people that wanted to amend the Idaho Human Rights Act uh, the Idaho Human Rights Act is a state-level uh, non-discrimination law, basically. And the way that the mechanism that it's enforced is through this commission that basically prosecutes people on your behalf. So if you were, uh, let's say, living in a wheelchair and you wanted to rent a house uh, and you wanted to rent this specific house because it didn't have any stairs in it, for example... Uh, and the person who had the house for rent said, no, you're not allowed, to, I don't want to rent to you because you're in a wheelchair, then you could file a uh, complaint with the Idaho Human Rights Commission and they would prosecute this uh, landlord on your behalf uh, because discrimination on those grounds in the state of Idaho is illegal. So this group called Add the Words wanted to add two new protected legal categories to this anti-discrimination law, and that was um, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity were the two new categories. And these people were people that I did not understand, but I wanted to understand. And so I showed up at their meetings because that's what you do when you're curious, right? You just, well, I've talked to these people. So I show up to a meeting that's advertised in the paper and 
the assumption of everybody there is uh, that anybody that shows up is supportive by default. And I didn't go out of my way to correct that assumption. I'm just curious and there to learn. Uh, and I'm not actively hostile to these people. I want to learn more. So they're more than excited to tell me about all of the reasons that they need this law and all this. Uh, and over the course of that me meeting with them and talking with folks for a couple hours, it becomes clear that there's no actual strategy to this group. They're, they believe in this principle and they don't really have any political skills or marketing skills or um, PR stuff. There's no plan for how are we going to go from this is an idea to this is a law. There's no, there's some base level understanding of the political process of like the hoops that you need to jump through, but there's no strategy or vision of, or of getting buy-in from all of the, the, uh, either the selectorate, the like people that vote these people in office or the uh, electorate, the people that would vote to get this through these various uh, hoops. And there's just no vision. And so at this point, I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, I have an, I have, I know what's enough about what's going on here that I, I could help you guys. Um, so I pitch them on, hey, look, okay. I don't know anything about your, your history of what's going on here, but I can tell you from an outside perspective looking in, you're not going, three years from now, nothing is going to change unless these things change. And I, I basically laid out a, like a plan, which um, seems so basic to me now. And I can't believe I had the hubris to do this also at like 20 something, 21 or 22 years old. So I just walk in this person, I know nothing. And I'm telling these people they're doing everything wrong. Actually, what you need to do is uh, we need a plan. We need uh, buy-in from everybody here about who, what the plan is that we're all going to be committed, even if you disagree. That no, the, the best thing is you need a unified front. So everybody decide who's the important people. We're going to get a, a a board, and everybody decides that these are the the important people uh, to be able to make this decision. It's great. Then we'll now we'll have a board. This board is going to come up with this a three-year and a five-year plan. We're going to hire a consultant to, to do branding for us. We're going to hire somebody else to do research so that we can start getting, um, uh, what's the word, PR marketing stuff. Because um, in politics, everything is about uh, substance, not about substance. It's actually about the words, the literal words that you speak. Um, anybody that's done social research can tell you this also, that if you frame something as uh depending on how you frame something will completely change the way somebody answers the question. So if you ask a question like, do you support corporal punishment versus do you ever think that it's appropriate to spank your child? You're asking the same question, but the way that you're framing that is totally different and you're using totally different words. The way people will process that is so different that they'll answer differently on polls. Um, if they'll they'll vote differently on candidates who speak about this one way versus the other, even if the candidates are saying the exact same thing uh, in substance. And so we had to do hired somebody to do research on words to use. Eventually, um, basically made this pitch. They're like, "Yes, great. What great? What?" <laughs> um, literally, at my first meeting, showing up, they put me in charge of all of their online presence. Uh, I built them a website that week. Uh, I s created the like Facebook page, the Twitter page, um, started uh, making like meme templates um, and, and, and creating brand guidelines. Um, once we did some, we hired this other group to, to do research on like words and what people uh, emotionally responded to and then came up with a whole like uh, PR branding training that everybody went through that anybody, and then anybody that showed up on camera or was going to represent the group had to go through before they were allowed to, um, talk to any media so that everybody was consistent and presenting this consistent message. And, uh, over the course of the next like six months, my plan was wildly successful and blew my own expectations out of the water to the point where we have a, we, get we got like majority popular support um people are organically reaching out to their senators and demanding the, a vote on this thing we get a bill uh the bill goes to committee and there's a hearing and i did not expect that to happen in six months i expected this to be like a two-year thing 
So the committee is happening. <clears throat> the hearing is happening. Uh, and I show up for this hearing. And there's a, a, a political opposition that was mostly religious uh, fundamentalist groups that they brought a bunch of people in from out of town to oppose this. And the, a bunch of those people got up and literally like opened the Bible and just started reading. <laughs> and it was very funny. Um, and most of these people also, because of my background, were people that I personally knew uh -huh. that are getting up to talk about and oppose this thing. And I've just been doing like six months of work helping these other people uh, try to get this bill before this committee. And uh, also <clears throat> throughout this process, um, I have, have experienced a breakup that is the most traumatic thing that I've ever experienced in my life. Um, and I'm profoundly lonely. Um, I, I don't even know how to, to put words the amount of craving that I had for attention and affection was uh, probably dripped off of me. <laughs> um, and then I'm, but every time I'm around these people who I'm helping with this political issue, they're constantly praising me. They're constantly complimenting me, telling me how great I am, how impressed they are with me in this thing and um, what I've done. And I'm such a great writer and it's such a great speaker. And I also have these other, like, how are you a real person? And like, um, just constant uh, compliments and affection, attention uh, that at the time I was really craving. Um, and it wasn't just coming from these people. It was also because of the greater media attention coming from uh, higher status people like, um, at one point, the director of the ACLU came to town. She knew who I was and like introduced herself to me, made a point of that. Um, so did the person who was the director of like Hillary Rodham Clinton's campaign, presidential campaign. So did the director of Planned Parenthood. Like th this is had the me of six months ago had no conception of this being even possible that uh, these people know who I am and want to talk to me <laughs> <laughs> and are reaching out to me. Um, then one guy, uh, his name was Trevor from the Human Rights Campaign, who's who helped with a lot of the word research. He super encourages me to um, speak for this uh, committee, as well as the director of ACLU. All these people are like, you got to speak at this. You got to do a, um, a a testimony for in support of this bill. So the testimony goes all day. And it's pretty much all opposition people that speak because they're the folks that came in from out of town. So the next day, uh, there's going to be another opportunity to testify for this bill. So that night, I go home. I don't sleep. Instead, I write a uh, testimony. And this is what I was describing as the political performance. Everything that I wrote, every single word, I, I write as, as if it's true about me. None of it is true about me. Um, the purpose of me writing the speech was to get an emotional response from the people on the committee um, and try to humanize the issue for them. And the way that I did it was uh, through story, because story is the most powerful force on earth. And so I told a story that was not true about myself, as if it was true about myself. Um, and I succeeded, again, beyond what my wildest imaginations immediately went viral. Uh, my grandma called me the next day and was like, I saw you on the news and, and, and like, and is have, breaking down, having an emotional conversation with me about this things, things that I've said that she believed now were real things and true things about me and my life that were a political performance to me in my mind. Um, and even after, immediately after the, I deliver this performance, <laughs> um, I'm grabbed by the arm by Cherie Buckner Webb, who's a famous jazz singer and like six five woman, she's huge, and she she, she like grabs me by the arm. And she's like, "Honey, you need to come with me." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> and she she like pulls me out of the auditorium where we're delivering the speech, and 
I'm immediately greeted by a dozen people who are just bawling and just absolutely in tears. And they all hug me and are crying and like, thank you. Like, you're so brave. And like, and I can't believe you did that. And again, like, here's me, the loneliest I have ever been in my life uh, then or since, um, the most desperate and attention starved and craving that, and like, that I've ever been. And there are these people that want to love me. And so I figured it was easiest to get the love that I wanted to continue by continuing to go down that path and then live my life as if this things that I said were true and this wasn't just a political performance. Um, so that was the the first half of your question. the The second half was related to the this event that then leads to me getting kidnapped and trafficked, <laughs> and then I end up homeless in New York. So. One of the people that's in that group of uh, uh, about a dozen people that hug me and are crying and telling me how brave I am uh, is a girl at the time, she would have been 13 years old, uh, trans girl, whose speech uh, and testimony also went viral. Um, and she, lay, a few months later, starts posting pictures to her public Facebook profile that, how do I describe these pictures? I, in my mind at the time and still, like the only conceivable reason that somebody who's 13, 14 years old would be posting photos like this is uh, if they were being groomed or if they, what's the word? Like in my mind, I'm seeing these photos that are taken by a photographer that are clearly trying to sexualize this person who's underage. And I'm going like the reddest of flags possible. What is happening here? Like some everything about this is wrong. And also the fact that she's excited to post these pictures and the, uh, what's the word? The fact that nobody in her life has flagged this as a no, this isn't a thing that you should do and trying to take the down makes, makes me immediately suspect of her parents. Um, uh, interrupting my story, eventually uh, I ended up like practically adopting her and she lives with me for a few years. Um, and then we, uh, it took a, a few years but we eventually found a nice um, family that she did got formally adopted with um, just before she turns 18. But that's way further ahead in the story. Um, at this point in the story, she's posted these crazy pictures on Facebook. Um, I'm immediately concerned. I reach out to her and I'm like, hey, who took these pictures? Uh, I want to meet them. And she tells me who took the pictures. Uh, it turns out that they were taken by somebody who's trying to start a modeling or talent agency. And so I'm like, okay, well, I have to meet this person uh, and figure out whether I need to turn them into the police, you know? And uh, so they have an, a, an host and like an open casting call and I show up for it. And at first, there nothing seems to be odd. Uh, people are showing up. They're filling out forms, legal forms for like consent of uh, image release kind of stuff. That's not nothing unusual happening uh, for the entertainment world. Stuff like the, the clothing size, body dimension stuff. Um, it's also not unusual. Um, and then there's this moment and i have i have not experienced anything like this again for or since we're all sat in this conference room waiting for this woman who's the owner of this talent agency who's the person that uh i've been told is took these pictures and we're, we're all sitting around in this conference room uh talking with each other and this woman comes through the door and Everything about her drips confidence and poise and you, the entire room, it's uh, sometimes if, if people are like waiting for a person, you know, there's this moment where everybody kind of goes quiet or what it was, what they were talking about, it, it quiets down. 
this time instead of it would it literally everybody stopped mid sentence and you could hear a pin drop and there was nothing and the and and this woman who just stepped in the door revels in the silence and doesn't immediately break it and holds it for almost an uncomfortable long amount of time and then and then and then she breaks the posture and sits down and she still hadn't said a word and then uh and i've ne and i've never and i look around the room every single person in this room is looking at her and her their entire attention is focused directly on this person um and like nothing else matters in the world and i'd never seen anything like that in my life where somebody just commands the attention of everybody instantly without speaking a word and in that moment i literally forgot my entire purpose for being there and i said what whatever just happened is the most valuable thing on earth and i need to learn that <laughs> and uh me having that uh moment of recognizing that there's something happening here that i don't understand that i need to learn uh eventually leads me to pitching myself as a hey i need to intern here um i have these skills that i've just used to launch this political campaign successfully and a matter of months. Here's my plan for you. I'll do this all for free. I'll just want to be a fly on the wall. My very first day being in the office and working for this woman, she gets a call uh, the, uh, from who was the person that called her? Uh, I forget the I forget her name. A voice I recognized because at the time she had just won an Emmy the year prior for for uh, her work on a television show. And I'm like, why is this Emmy award-winning producer calling you, calling you? Like, what's, what? And trying to pitch you on something. What's happening here? She gets off that phone call. She gets called, as, literally as soon as she hangs up the call, she gets another call from another Emmy award-winning television producer. And I'm sitting here like, what did, what did I just walk into? Like, I knew that I, like, I needed to be here and I needed to learn what was happening, but I didn't realize other people knew this. <laughs> and uh, in that moment, uh, her name's Amy. She decides we're, we're going to go to uh, New York and we're going to have a reality TV show about this company and about me. And I have multiple comp TV, uh, Emmy award-winning TV producers that are like trying to uh, compete for me to sign an exclusivity agreement with me and this is going to be great um, and that begins the process of me eventually going to New York um, over the course of the, the months leading up to that though uh, whenever this my, my view of this woman comes from this is an unreal person I have no idea what's happening with you to something nothing about this woman makes sense everything is it's like there's two people living in the same body on the one hand you have this person that has an understanding of of the ability to control and communicate that i've never seen before and on the other hand you have a person that's a like sociopathic just lies all of the time constantly making up bad things about other people that aren't true literally believes them to be true um and is also constantly ruining her own life. Like really fundamental basic things like uh, she just have a freak out moment and just break her computer, for example. She went on a photo shoot, brought her literal desktop computer to it, put it in the trunk of her car, uh, then somehow is like leaving this photo shoot, has her trunk open and backs up. The, the computer falls out of the back of the car and she runs it over. How is any of this possible? I have no idea. Like how no normal human, this is a level of incompetence I've never seen. And uh, yet somehow this is the same person. Like that doesn't make any sense. So she's constantly having crises like this, just like on a near daily basis. And every time she does, I just immediately solve it. Um, and so when that, that specific instance happens, I literally just order a new computer, get same day shipping. She has the next computer the next day. Like, uh, and I didn't ask her, her permission to do that. I just did it. Um, she was constantly getting tickets because she would just park illegally every day. Why? Who, and like the legal parking is a block away. You don't have to park illegally here. Um, 
and but she would park illegally just every day and get take <laughs> these tickets. And so one day I wake up in the morning and I had slept overnight in the office that day. Uh, and by the way, I'm not getting paid for this work. I'm still doing this all for free. I quit my paid job to do this job for free for her. I'm sleeping overnight at the office of work. I wake up at like 6 a.m. to go for a morning run. And I get down uh, to the bottom of the flight of stairs at the office. I go out the door and there's her car on the back of a tow truck. And I'm like, excuse me. Hello. Hi. This is my friend's car. And he's like, okay. She's. Did you know she has like some ungodly, it was like hundreds of dollars worth of parking tickets. So I was like, I knew she had a couple, but I didn't realize it was that bad. And she's like, yeah, she's like, your friend's gonna have a problem. I was like, so how much do, what, what can I do to, to get you to, to, to not tow her car? And he's like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, like, nor you're gonna take it to a place, right? And then they're gonna have to pay money to, to get it from that place and then pay off all the tickets. He's like, yeah, I was like, what if I'll just pay it all now? <laughs> And he's like, I mean, like, hypothetically, you could do that. But like, I don't have a way to process payment. Like, I, so unless you have it cash, there's nothing I can do. And I said, like, do you have three minutes? And he's like, yeah. And so I literally run up the stairs where I just came from. And at the time, I kept on on my person, like, at the office, more than $1,000 of cash, because these emergency kind of things were so common. So I literally grabbed the money in cash, run back down, hand it to the guy, it was like something like six hundred dollars, like five eighty five or something, to pay for the tow plus the late fees plus all the tickets. And then he just like, oh, he's he, the man's in absolute bewilderment. It's like, okay, I mean, like, fine. And gets and writes up the receipt and pays it all off. And I check with the city, and yeah, the tickets are paid off. So there it is. And then I didn't tell her. And then I was just, I just moved. I just got the keys for a car and moved it to the legal parking spot. And then when she woke up in the morning, told her that I moved it to the legal parking spot. And um, ev eventually, one can can only do this kind of thing so many times before somebody figures out, oh, you have money and you don't have an emotional attachment to money. Um, and Amy figured that out uh, after a couple of months of me just doing things for her like this. Um, and so then rather than me just giving uh, unconditionally out to her in this way, uh, it became a, her asking for things. It became a her demanding things. And then it became a her trying to emotionally manipulate me to do other things. For And by the time we end up on the plane to, oh gosh, I'll tell you, <laughs> this is a great example of like, the level of insanity that this got to. Uh, the day before we're to get on a plane, um, at this point, she doesn't have a place to stay for the last night. <laughs> um, and I knew that my uh, aunt and uncle were out of town for a wedding. So I'm like, oh, hey, my aunt and uncle are out of town for a wedding. You don't have a place to stay. We can just go stay over at their house for the night. It's not a big deal. They're out of town anyways. I have the keys to their place. They've let me know that the, I can stay there whenever I want. It's not a, a a big deal. So we go to my aunt and uncle's house and we arrive at about, I don't know, eight something PM and the light's on inside. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. Then why would they leave the lights on? That's very unlike them. So I go in and I'm like, hey, is anybody home? Like, and my uncle responds, yeah, what's up at, at Astrid? And I'm like, I thought you were at a wedding. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, well, I got called into work. So I'm going tomorrow. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'm going to stay here. Is it all right if my friend and I stay the night here? And he's like, yeah, it's fine. Um, don't even worry about like doing the laundry. And I'm like, cool. Um, so I would go back out and tell Amy, yeah, my uncle's here. He's fine with us staying the night. And she's like, no, what did you tell him? I said, I told him me and my friend are here. And, and is it okay if we stay the night? She's like, Astrid, no, you, 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 you just lied. And I was like, <laughs> what <laughs> and she's like you need to go to your uncle and you need to apologize to him right now and I was like what am I apologizing for she's like you're still in denial I can't believe you you're such a, like you're a pathological liar you don't you lied and you don't even know it and I'm like what did I lie about she's like I'm not your friend I'm your boss and I'm like okay so, <laughs> semantic difference to me but that's fine so I'm uh, I, I go back and she's like, are you going to go apologize? Sure. 
fine, whatever. So I go back in, uh, my uncle, I'm like, hey, I feel like I need to apologize. He's like, okay, for what? And I'm like, so I lied to you when I said my friend and I need to say or wanted to say a word because it's actually my boss. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, that's all. I just wanted to relieve my guilty conscience. He's like, okay. Like this is the absurdity right now. The fact that I'm like lying to try and protect somebody else's thing for the fact that I'm supposedly lying the first time. Okay. So I go back outside. I tell her this. She's like, Astrid, you're still lying. And I was like, please, what did I do this time? I'm like, I have, I have no idea what this woman is on about. She's like, you for you neglected to mention the fact that I have my infant son and it's not just you and me. And I was like, oh my God. Again, I didn't even, I never would have thought to like mention, it's so not a big deal to me. And I was like, okay. So she's, so I'm like, so I, do I need to go apologize to him again? Or like, I'm like, this time I'm like, I have no idea what this woman wants for me. And she's like, no, I, I, I'm just, I'm not, I'm so uncomfortable with this entire situation. I can't believe that you put me and my son in this, this whole situation and that you were just lying and just, you're so um, compulsively do this that you don't even have an idea that you're doing it while you're doing it. And I was just like, so we go, uh, she, she starts telling me that I'm responsible for her child's death, that I'm going to give him asthma, that, um, he's going to die of hypothermia like that night because we're going to be sleeping in a car. And I was like, you just get a hotel. I don't understand where like where any of this is coming from. She's like, no, I, this is such a, I can't believe I can't rely on you for anything. You're so just like the worst. And like, she starts going off for an hour. I'm not exaggerating about every conceivable saying every derogatory thing one could say about a person. Uh, and then the, after that, I'm like, okay, so what's, what are we doing now? Like, where are we going? Uh, I'm happy to take us to a hotel or, and she's like, no, I'm going to call my friend. So she calls her friend uh, and asks him if we could stay with him for the night. And he says, yeah. So we go over to his house. We arrive at his house. Her, you open the door to his house and smoke comes out of the house. <laughs> And she's like, and then she turns to me and immediately starts screaming at me that I'm responsible for killing her child with cancer in 10 years because I, I made us sleep in this guy's house that has filled with smoke. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> the next day we wake up, uh, we're leaving on an airplane, right? Uh, and she hadn't packed her bag, so I had to pack her bag for her. So I pack her bag for her. We uh, we leave to go later than I tell her that we need to leave by. On our way to the airport, we pass an IHOP, and she starts telling me that we need she needs breakfast, and we need to go. Uh, she needs uh, pancakes, like a specific dish that they serve at the IHOP. And so I'm like, well, we don't have time. With our plane leaves like in an hour, and we should have been at security already. She's like. Who told you you need to be an hour early for security? This is nonsense. We just arrive when it's time. Like, this is, I can't, have you ever flown before? <laughs> like, I'm not responsible for us being late. She's like, whatever. So we pull up to the IHOP. At this point, IHOP and its history was experimenting with drive throughs I pull into the drive through She starts screaming at me. What are you doing? I was like, we're getting your breakfast. She's like, oh my God, only an insane person eats in a car. What are you doing? I can't, like, I can't believe that you would even assume that I would do anything other than sit down at a table and enjoy my meal. And I'm like, okay, so we park, we get, we wait in line, we sit down, she has her meal, we get up, we go into the airport, we're going through security, um, and she, at the last moment, decides to switch her carry-on with her uh, take-on, and as a result of that, the, the, the bag that she tries to take through security is filled with thousands of dollars of makeups and perfumes, <laughs> which security immediately pulls her over for and tells her she can't take any of it through. So then she has to call her brother to come and pick it up um, and uh, mail it to her or something. Um, but anyways, we we get to the gate, of course, the, plane, the plane's left an hour ago by the time we get there. And she starts screaming at the poor woman working at Delta Airlines that the they're so irresponsible for abandoning a customer and all that. And I like literally 
physically have to grab her and move her <laughs> to another part of the airport. And I go back to this woman. I'm like, if I told you the last 48 hours of my life, you would not believe me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> like This person is doing this to you. You don't deserve this. And she's like, oh my God, you wouldn't believe how often this happens. And she literally, without even asking me, rebooks the flight to uh, the next available flight to go to the same place. I was like, this is the most incredible customer experience I've ever had in my life. <laughs> what is this? So I go back to, to Amy. I'm like, you would not believe she didn't even charge us to rebook the flight. And I didn't even have to ask. She just did it. And then Amy looks at the ticket and the new flight has a layover rather than being a direct flight. And she starts screaming at me again. <laughs> and like, I can't believe you would let her do this. That she, she put us on the cheap flight. That's time to have a, we're going to waste a whole hour of our time. Do you know about the opportunity cost is an hour of my time? <laughs> like, like, so by the, we get on this plane we go to the layover. By the time we get on the, the next plane that's going to a place, a different place, like I'm checked out. <laughs> like I have a I have a very high bar of, of patience and tolerance for mental hey. illness. <laughs> yeah. Much higher than a normal sane person. But but the uh I I be, I literally dissociate on the last plane. I don't remember anything about the plane ride. I remember getting on the plane and then I remember being at the place. Um and over the course of the next uh, several days uh, and being in a mildly to severe dissociative state, <laughs> uh, I lose out on, basically she drains one of my bank accounts to spend uh, uh, at a mall trying to impress somebody um, by showing how much money she has. She doesn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> and she just steals one of my credit cards and or one of my debit cards and drains my entire bank account. Um, when she realizes that there's no more money in there, she starts demanding that that uh, my money is actually her money, that I've stole it from her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and um, that it's owed to her. Um, and actually, I'm committing like some some kind of invented crime. What does she call it? corporate fraud or something by like keeping it from her um yeah <laughs> so she demands like Astrid you have people in your family that have money right and I'm like I mean like yeah I guess my mom's side of the family she's like call your grandma <laughs> so she coaches me through a call with my grandmother asking my grandmother for money <laughs> like a literal <laughs> And I'm like so checked out that I don't have the willpower to resist anything at this point. And that is basically this the series of things that get progressively only worse from there to the point where within a week in a week, I basically have no money. My all of my identity documents and uh access to money is withheld from me. I don't have any access to it. My phone, I'm only given access to when she's in the room and is coaching me through everything to say for every phone call that I receive or in, ingoing, outgoing, including to my parents. Um, she gets access to all of my retirement accounts eventually, through all my identity documents and stuff, uh, and basically just drains like every liquid form of uh, money that I have, and I'm held hostage. Uh, and... Yeah, that's that's how that weird situation. There's like so many red flags that a normal person would not and like lack of respect for boundaries or human worth or that like it's inconceivable to that a me of now would put up with any of it because I have no zero tolerance for uh people not respecting my humanity. <laughs> the me at the time, I had no self-worth. I had no self respect, pride, self-love. Um, and uh, it was easier to just go along with things than to put up the resistance at the time. Um, and so I ended up, yeah, getting literally kidnapped uh, across several, uh, trapped across several states and then had all my money stolen from me. And then when she figured out all the money was gone, she had, she gave me a script to record a blackmail video that of me admitting to my crimes and then left me uh on the street in harlem new york have you seen <laughs> her since i have not seen her since uh -huh.
now she has a warrant out for her arrest in two states um for this and other things yeah i have so many questions <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't even know where to begin. Um, <laughs> um, what, how do you understand her now? How do I understand her? Oh, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. Like over here, I'm like, oh, she's, she's a sociopath. Is that how you see her? How do you what 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 um, sense do you make of her and what her behavior is and why she was acting the way she was and if I yeah. was going to put a clinical diagnosis, uh, sociopathy and uh, ADHD are two of the ones that <laughs> were definitely seem appropriate. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think she had any understanding of other people or like value of their emotions, um, but she clearly had the ability to like. She was aware of the emotions of the people and had the incredible ability to manipulate other people. Um, yeah, that I, again, like her ability to, her presence, when she had, like turned it on, it was everything about her posture and the way she moved and the way she talked, the words that she used, the pace at which she said that everything was like so refined. Uh, and then when it was off, it was just... <laughs> a chaos woman <laughs> i don't know um yeah i don't i don't uh i don't know i don't know what to make of all that uh <laughs> she's a strange she's a strange person i've i at this point i've now met more than more sociopaths than just her so and uh also after me now i know like know all of the early signs uh and so they're very easy to avoid <laughs> <laughs> But the, yeah, it was very much probably a case of sociopathy and then me not having a, enough self, any sense of self-preservation, uh, plus my already like innate proclivity to just like give to people unconditionally, um, which is a habit that I had from like my earliest recollection like literally every time that I got money as a kid I would just donate it all to charity like the instant that I got it mm -hmm. um that was normal and not unusual for me um and I didn't think anything of it and I, that continued like a friend would have a medical emergency and I would just call the hospital and pay their bills like mm -hmm. and not tell them this is not unusual way to live life because this is just how I've lived life and then I just fell into a person that was like oh oh <laughs> you know, a big one here. yeah that's right <laughs> we got a big fish <laughs> wow uh what are the signs that you look for now with sociopaths oh gosh um I, you, you really learned this lesson the hard way yeah, Astrid. I, you I learned the real hard way i have learned many lessons the hard way <laughs> um I don't know uh, how, how the best way to answer this is I have learned that my intuition is very, very good and that I should not question it. And I should just do, go with my intuition on other people uh, and figure out why I have the intuition later. And it's much less important. And any, when I, when I think back on my life, all of the moments of regret or that I think of now as like bad decisions are decisions that I felt were the wrong decision to make in the moment, but intellectually made sense. Um, mm. And if I had just trusted my gut about a person or a decision or a situation that that was always the right choice. And so now I, I lead with my gut and uh, my gut has gotten very good at identifying people. Yeah. <laughs> I, Cause I've been exposed to, this is one of, of many, Sure. Uh, very uh, disordered people. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did you, like, what did you do after you were just in Harlem and she'd like left you? And how did you get out of that whole oh, gosh. black hole of karma? Yeah. Day one, I was like, well, I guess I'm a sociopath and I need. Oh my gosh. Help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, this is how dissociated I was. So I literally walked several miles to the New York uh, what's it called? 
Presbyterian Hospital um, and checked myself in to the psych ward and um, on Christmas Eve <laughs> and then uh, waited for eight hours. And then a doctor came and was like, at, had talked with me for about five minutes and then discharged me and was like, there's not, you're, you're fine. There's nothing wrong. Why, why did you come here? <laughs> you're wasting everybody's time. <laughs> <laughs> and I checked out and then immediately checked back in. And uh, so then I spent another several hours waiting on a Christmas day, was there again in the psych ward talking to a different person. And uh, that person was even more confused than the first person. And they're like, you, we just, this I, I, this person just saw you eight hours ago and then you checked yourself right back in and like, <laughs> what are you doing? And so they were, they were, had a more of a longer conversation there. And the thing they came away with like, was like, okay, so you're homeless now and you don't have any money. It sounds like you've just been through something that I have no ability to understand. Um, but like, you know, it's, nothing's wrong with you. <laughs> like, you're <laughs> fine. <laughs> and so- they like went, uh, gave me a list of resources for uh, homeless people in the area. And they're like, here's where you could get free food at these times and these places. Um, here's phone numbers for all these places. Here's all the homeless shelters where you could go. And so I um, just showed up at places. <laughs> um, there's a place called the Alley Forney Center. Um, and that's where I ended up sleeping uh, for, I don't know, some number of weeks. Um, it must have been fewer than three, but it was more than two. Um, my sense of time is not good. This whole, yeah. Uh, and so they, I had breakfast there and then I had dinner and place to sleep at the end of the night there. Um, and then for the rest of the day, it was, there's not a lot to do. Um, <laughs> did a lot of wandering around New York, um, a lot of walking. Uh, and I really, it didn't even begin to make sense of the thing that I'd gone through until like months, months later. Um, but I had, it, it turns out uh, I knew some of the early Bitcoin developers and um, back in the early uh, 2010s, like literally people like sent me to conferences to like talk to people about Bitcoin. So I had some Bitcoin and that was one of my, the only form of money that I had that was not in a bank account that couldn't get drained. And so I remembered, oh, wait a minute, I have Bitcoin. Bitcoin's probably worth something. <laughs> At the time, it was like $300 of Bitcoin or something. So that was enough to get me a plane ticket back to the West Coast. Um, and then eventually to uh, Arizona, where I stayed with friends. Um, and then they paid for my food and um, allowed me to stay with them while I emotionally recovered and looked for a job. And uh, that didn't last long. And <clears throat> But yeah, that was, that was the immediate coming out of that situation where I, what I did and. <laughs> what helped you to start making sense of what had happened to you? Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't even able to make sense of it till like 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, I needed to be financially at a place where I wasn't constantly thinking about food and <laughs> uh, like, yeah. So it was literally probably a, a like a number of dollars in my bank account, plus my rent being played, plus having food in the pantry that I was like, oh, things are fine here. Okay. I should figure out what the hell's going on with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. And uh, yeah, that, that was, there was a, there was a definite moment where I was like, okay, it's time to have this conversation with myself right now. And that conversation lasted several weeks. Um, and there was, pretty much all the processing happened so in that period of time, two years after the events. <laughs> hmm. But I, I was just like in a constant crisis of, I don't have enough to eat. I don't know where I'm going to sleep tomorrow for that whole period of time that I couldn't, that my immediate ability to live to the next day was more pressing than, yeah, anything totally. else. When you did have time to dive into that and to, you know, in the context and the right situation, what mm. kinds of things did you learn? 
uh, I learned that I had no value for myself, that I didn't love myself, that I didn't enjoy life, that, um, well, not that I didn't enjoy life. I enjoyed life, but it was that I didn't enjoy the person that I was. I, um, yeah, I just, I didn't like me. Um, mm. and that probably sounds like really obvious. Like why else would you just like immediately surrender the, and not put up any resistance to a person that's demanding everything from you? Um, but at the time that was a revelation for me that like, wow, okay, I don't like me. Why don't I like me? What are the things that I don't like about me? And is there, and, and I decided that all of those things were under my, in my control and uh, I decided to change them. And so I did. <laughs> yeah. Is your sense now that she was trying to manipulate this trans girl that sort of you met that kicked off this whole adventure? Uh, oh, yeah. She was 100% trying to exploit her uh, mm -hmm. for her own personal, like, gain status, mm -hmm. but not, like, sexually in the mm -hmm. way that I initially thought. Um, it was more a, this is a person that has a good reputation and went viral, and I can, by attaching myself to this person, get more attention on myself and, and attract money, and uh, she was right about it. To be hmm. fair, like that's why the TV producers, for example, had known about her and reached out to her. Um, it's because she was able to get media attention through by attaching her brand to somebody else's that was already getting media attention. Hmm. Yeah. And then the second that she got that attention, then she completely let this other person go in exactly the same way that she later did to me. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. You said much earlier that you wouldn't have made the same choice about this political statement that you made. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, how do you view that now? Like, why wouldn't you make the same choice now? Oh, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I value uh, myself. <laughs> um, and uh, honesty uh, as a principle, as a high minded ideal, because <laughs> then I was like, I cared more about my immediate need for attention um, and love and feeling of love that I didn't have and the lack thereof. That was the thing that was driving me. Um, and yeah, and then like, oh, there was a whole series of decisions that came afterwards of like, oh, I've made this big statement that's like literally not true about me. It's about a fictional person that I invented on a sleepless <laughs> night. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, now I'm surrounded by all these people who believe that this person is real and that that's me. And so I guess that's the life I'm going to live for a while now. And mm. that's how I will get this love that I need. Um, that I, I just have no relationship to the person that would be, make that decision. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Were there any like karmic consequences or like after effects or of telling that lie that you had to sort of unwind or... Oh, still still continually uh -huh. it's uh, i suspect it's going to be an unwinding for many years to come <laughs> uh -huh. hmm. can you tell me about one of them uh let's see what is a good example uh okay one of them everybody seems to be really confused about my gender <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um because for a while i was dressing in a certain way and talking in a certain way and behaving in a certain way in order to match my actions to this invented uh fictional person mm -hmm. uh and now i don't do that but people still who met me during this period of time talk about me and they interact with me in and uh as if this is still real mm -hmm. even though i've had a conversation and told them and like um yeah and i including family members including uh certain friend groups and uh yeah, I, I just suspect that's going to take a while because habits die hard and the you that exists in the brains of uh, of other people is very different from the you and your own relationship to yourself. How do you think about your gender now? Gender? Mm -hmm. I don't. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Did the bill ever pass? No, it did not pass. No, it, it failed in committee. Uh, and the, the 
the folks that that were involved in pushing it uh what's the word there's there's a very real sense of like social momentum that like a, a kind of a media attention gives you mm -hmm. that as soon as the media attention drops and you you experience this this like loss which in my brain like at the time i'm like of course this is not gonna pass like this is our first round of this, this is a good practice run but in the brain like everybody got like so hopeful and invest emotionally invested in this thing that as soon as it didn't work out then they felt like they had lost something and and we lost a lot of um mo like social momentum and the people that were involved a lot of them dropped off and stopped participating and uh, stopped engaging and um the whole like organization the people most of those people left moved stopped uh participating and so that like the whole all of the all of the social momentum just like completely evaporated after the the bill didn't pass which like yeah not, nobody was nobody was ready and prepared for this to be a like three to five year process it was wow we get, got here way faster than we are and then oh now it's over right so now it's still an ongoing thing um but it's different people that are behind it um and they're they're aiming for the same thing but it's a uh, what's the word i i'm not optimistic for them <laughs> they don't have your strategy brain <laughs> it sounded like the way you're from the way you're describing it that it was almost like an interesting thought exercise for like a 20 21 yeah. year old astrid where you're That's like right. hmm, i wonder if i could do this like i don't really care about this issue necessarily but i bet i could make this work and yeah is that that's, that's right yeah i think uh -huh. that's how i thought of it at the time and now the way that i think of it is i learned a lot of very valuable things um through that process but like if i if you ask me today do i write the bill or do i vote yes on it if like i'm on the committee i know i would vote no hmm. which is really probably horrifying to hear if you're listening to this and you knew me from this person that was engaged in this thing and did all this work why um, would you vote no i believe that it's more important that people have the ability to choose for themselves hmm. um and that using force uh to remove choices from other people is uh not not the word, the word evil comes to mind but is not a i don't wouldn't say that i believe necessarily in evil but the like if if you make the choice to invite people into your life or not invite people into your life i don't think anybody has the right to tell you that you've made the wrong choice and force you to make that choice or give or or tell you that the or like give you penalties for making that choice I basically don't believe in penalties or punishments for anything. Um, and I, that was a thing that I learned about myself through this process is that I'm a pacifist. And that was not something that I knew about myself until I was kidnapped and came to terms with my own imminent death. That I was like, yeah, actually, I wouldn't defend myself. And, and it wasn't until later that I had a very hard conversation with myself of figuring out that whether or not, because from an app, if I totally divorce myself from me being this person in the situation and go, well, this just sounds like somebody with no sense of self-preservation. Mm. <laughs> like, but no, I think this is an actual thing that I value is uh, peace and nonviolence and um, pacifism. And so I'm not, I'm not going to, to uh, prevent other people from making choices and use or use punishments, guilt, uh, et cetera, to, to try and control them. Are you still, do you still subscribe to the political views of libertarianism and the animal rights activists ideas that you were interested in at that time uh, or later? I, I have been a, a vegan for most of my life now, mm -hmm. uh, if that answers that question. Mm -hmm. um, and politically, I find the, the ideas of liberalism the most interesting and the most um, robust like uh worldviews and mm -hmm. there and i say and there are like dozens of forms of liberalism and they're all interesting to me and um that's one of my like areas of historical research um is trying is trying to like document and tell a different story of 
all of the kinds of liberalisms that have existed historically and how they interact and who influenced whom and and how things all came together to like the idea that we have now of this unified political and philosophical set of ideas are like they all didn't they all came from very different places mm. uh and nothing about that process seemed inevitable like the thing that we ended up doesn't seem like an inevitable destination to me so mm -hmm. it's still endlessly interesting for that reason you said that um Mm. at a couple of points you sort of had this conversation with yourself about like what's happening here and who am I and yeah, what do yeah. I want to do and then you know you're like oh I should be having this more frequently and yeah, yeah. um question is something like yeah what is that process like for you what is it to introspect and check in with yourself and sort of do that yeah, so it's it's become uh there's a couple of different habits that I have. One of them is is a uh more of a seasonal habit where whenever I notice the season changing, uh I have a a really intentional day or several days depending on how that day goes of sit down figure out what's important to me. Am I the same person that I was the last time I did this? Um and I and I keep documents of of that like the results of that process and my conclusions every time. And it's like a very, uh, it's all nonverbal. Like the, I can't, I don't have this um, inner dialogue that uh, a lot of people do have. And so uh, the only way for me to like legibilize myself is to write things down. Mm. <laughs> and so, so I write things down and put on like literal sticky notes and I put that on a whiteboard and, and make connections and, and ask, ask myself questions like, um, who do I most look forward to spending time with? Um, and who do I feel most loved by? And uh, did I experience dread anytime recently or anxiety? Um, and what was the context and who was that with? And what were we doing? And um, it's like a very intentional series of questions that I ask myself. Uh, that are pretty consistent and have been for, I don't know, five years, six, what, what year are we in? Seven years now? Never mind. Um, and yeah, and as a result of that, very often I make decisions of who to spend more time with or less time with or remove from my life um, or bring into my life um, and what to do with my time. Um, like, Recently, like a recent example, uh, last year I decided that I wanted to explore dancing, uh, and so I did, and I was dancing like three to sometimes four nights a, a week, uh, practicing dancing, and I really loved it. And then after a year of that, realized that I really didn't look forward to the spending the time with the people that I was dancing with, and so now I'm no longer actively doing that. Um, I still love the dancing, but. I, need to be with it needs to I, I need to enjoy that aspect of it the social aspect as well so until I find that dancing's not a thing that I'm doing as much of like that's a, a, a concrete example that I can point to of a recent change in my life that I've made through the process I don't quite know how to ask this question but I'm curious about this process and what it means to you about like your sense of self or what a self is or who you are or identity or something like that. Oh, yeah. I very much believe that uh, who you are is a collection of choices. And because of that, that like who you are is, um, what's the word? Uh, your own invention that like mm. who you are is an active creation process all of the time. Um, and so like, me talking to you right now uh is me creating myself uh in the same way that you are creating yourself by having this conversation with me um whereas i think the conception of identity that i had when i was in my late teens for example was that who you are is some kind of intangible innate thing uh, and that the process of living is the process of figuring out and you you gradually could get more and more perspectives on this thing or carve out 
more refined version of this like essence of of identity and now i think it's more of a like active creation process hmm. i imagine that feels like exciting and, and and like inspiring and like like endlessly yeah inventive for you that's right yeah hmm. Hmm. i i say i say this to to everyone like incessantly that life's good and it gets better all the time and it's mm. not just the thing that i say that's a li literally my experience of living every mm. day i want to uh believe it or not i have not asked you a single of my <laughs> prepared <laughs> questions yet so i do want to ask some of these <laughs> um this is a quote on your website you say i was incredibly poor both emotionally and financially for most of my life and it wasn't until my mid twenties until I decided to change this. Um, yeah, in this moment, it strikes me as interesting that you said the word emotionally first. I mean, that's that's both interesting to say that someone could be poor emotionally, um, but it also sounds almost like you're prioritizing that there. Um, like, oh, I have to change the emotional relationship of it first, or something like that. And um, yeah, maybe you could talk about that first. What what does it mean to be poor emotionally? What was what did that mean? Yeah, my experience of the world was very uh what's the word egocentric um i was trapped inside of myself and uh i was not paying a lot of attention to the things going on in other people and so my my emotional world was completely like it was just a box that i was stuck in and other people's things would happen with other people and it would like bounce off of me. Like I was, <laughs> it, I was so in, wrapped up in myself that I, the, I feel like there's an entire dimension of emotions and human connection that I was completely missing and I was absent from my life. And then when these worldview shifts happened, the, my perspective on myself and the world and other people changed so radically that like now I have real relationships with other people. Um, and the, the things that are important and salient to me aren't just important and salient to me. They're also affecting other people and the, the entire like emotional realm, it feels like uh, it had an unlock after that uh realization and change in perspective i don't know if you've ever there's a book called uh nonviolent communication a language of life by marshall mm -hmm. walsenberg mm -hmm. uh this is one of the books that i helped unlock that for me of like thinking about other people and myself in terms of being big bags of need that are unmet <laughs> and those needs cause the emotions are like the symptoms of the needs hmm. and thinking about thing uh things in that way my experience of being in the world is seeing other people and and tapping into oh wow if that's the thing that you're doing or that's the way you're holding yourself i bet you have this unmet need um and getting better and better at identifying those and being able to engage with those people in a way that's beneficial to them um is like a constant joy it's just hmm. yeah can you give me like a plausible example of that or uh you know some example of how you related to someone like that hmm. i'm tr i'm trying to think of an example that uh without doxing somebody <laughs> Let's see. You can also, you could make it fictional or like anonymize it, or or you could also just like make up a story that's like plausible. That would be fine yeah. as well. Okay. Okay. I, no, I won't actually. I'll, uh -huh. My mom won't mind this. Uh -huh. So my uh, relationship to my mom for uh, after leaving the house was basically zero. Um, in my mind at the, uh, after leaving the house, I, I, my understanding of her was this is an evil person, uh, who doesn't care about you, um, and doesn't love you. And you've been a burden on her your whole life and just like nothing but an inconvenience, everything that was, uh, 
everything that you did or wanted that was different than what she wanted was an inconvenience for her. And that was my view of my mom. And if you have that set of beliefs, it's literally impossible. Like how would I have a relationship with my mom if I believe those things? And now I, my belief, my understanding of my mom is this is a person with a lot of unmet needs that have gone chronically unmet her whole life. And her actions, everything that she does is an attempt to try and meet one of these fundamental needs that are going unmet. Mm -hmm. And so, and that shift in perspective means like everything she does suddenly makes sense. Um, and and it, it's uh, so like emotionally salient to like, oh my gosh, like you are hurting so bad in this way. Um, and there's so like tiny things that I can do that are so easy that like immediately meet the underlying need. That's just like the most obvious thing in the world. Once you shift that in that perspective, they're like, wow, now I can have a relationship with my mom. Mm. <laughs> like that's a, yeah, that's a good salient real example. Mm. Mm. What are some of the ways that you started acting to meet her unmet needs and to begin to have a relationship with her? <laughs> um, I wondered if you were going to ask any question that I was uncomfortable answering, no. and now I am Very good. at that point. <laughs> Very good. Thanks for honoring your boundaries. I'm not a manipulative sociopath, I think, so <laughs> <laughs> I will not tell you about how evil you are now for having boundaries <laughs> and <laughs> try to coerce you into... <laughs> no. Um, what let me ask a different question about this which is what uh, how how does someone begin to identify someone's unmet needs your own oh, or someone else's this is the best question hmm. uh first you have to understand like if you don't buy into the worldview of nonviolent communication the system doesn't work hmm. and and if you um what's the word Nonviolent communication is just also like a one tool that if you buy into a certain worldview, unlocks a way of relating to other people. And you could you could read, it could be useful to you, even if you don't believe in this, the the assumptions that it makes. That he puts to his Marshall Rosenberg's credit, he puts it literally on like the first chapter of like, I believe all people are good and well-intentioned and um my man. It's, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> But if you don't believe that, uh, and you're hearing me talk about this, then some of the things probably don't make sense to you the way I'm talking about them. And there's so, so many other tools that you can use to understand um, other people and what they're needing. But the literally, this has been a process of, uh, what's the word, of constant learning for the last decade of my life. I'm trying to understand uh, other people and their emotions and everything from reading, getting better at reading nonverbals, um, to, uh, picking up on intricacies of speech that I wouldn't have noticed before everything and, and intricacies, not just in a general sense, but in sometimes more specific, like the way that women talk to each other is different than the way that women talk to men. And the way that men talk to women is different than the way that men talk to men. And, um, the the differences in uh, speech are so obvious once you start noticing, and they they allow they clue you in. Like everybody is constantly giving you clues to what they're what they think about and what they care about and and what their needs are. But it uh, it's it takes so much work to get to a place where you have an instinct for things, um, and that's kind of where I'm starting to get to the place where I feel like. I have an instinct for things and people tell me all the time, it feels like I'm reading their mind or like, um, and that's, I feel like still a failure if on my part, if, if they feel like I'm doing something unusual. Um, and so there's still all still like work to, to do on that front, but like, it's a, it's a long process and you have to, there's lots of reading and lots of practice and like literally there, there, for nonviolent communication specifically, it's going to sound, it's going to feel really awful and really awkward going through the practice. If you have somebody to go through and practice talking in that way with somebody, 
but you have to go through that stage to get to the stage where it becomes natural and you don't have to use the perfect exact framing, but you can still get to the same place and accomplish the same things. And um, yeah, NVC is, is uh, the first place that I point to as a place to learn and practice, but it's um, it has a poor reputation because when people are going through the beginning stages of it, it feels robotic and unnatural and like completely divorced from human emotion. <laughs> Uh, and people are really bad at it. And you, ha you have to go through a stage of being really bad at it to be really good at it, I think. Mm -hmm. What are some other things that you recommend people read to learn about? I'm, I'm very curious about this oh, bit yeah. about unmet needs in particular. Uh, parenting books mm -hmm. have a lot of really interesting things. Um, uh, some psychology stuff is useful. Most of it is bunk. I mean, parenting books are the same way. Some of it's useful, most of it's bunk. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that's lying around that's uh, almost like mystical, like <laughs> um, things like, uh, what's the word? Uh, hypnotism. <laughs> um, I've learned a lot from uh, hypnotists in terms of things that you can read off of another person just by looking at them without speaking or that they give away in, um, and also being able to read faces, not in just like expressions, but the way, the where the wrinkles are in person tells you about the expression that they make most. And what, what expression is that? You can tells you a lot about their habits um, and their habits are usually formed as a response to uh, some fundamental unmet need of theirs. Um, and so like, there's just so many, I, I don't, I don't know what, <laughs> ask <laughs> a more specific question. <laughs> I'll give you a really specific question. Great. Amazing. Uh, which is, um, you stated something that I really believe that all people are good and yeah. you also have, um, are well-intentioned and so on. And then yeah. we have also discussed this person in some detail that treated you yeah. quite poorly yeah. who, uh, I don't know, I'm understanding as a sociopath from the way that you describe them. Uh, and I wonder how you square those those two parts of your life, like believing that people are good yeah. and having had really upfront, uh, direct uh, encounters with someone who treated you quite poorly. Yeah, I, what's the word? I don't feel like there's a thing to square. Um, mm -hmm. This is a person who's dealt with a lot of trauma in their life and the way that they move in the world and the way that they treat other people is to try and get at something that they is missing inside of themselves. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. Do you have a sense now of what that was that she was missing? That is a great question. And I have not thought very much about that question and maybe I should think about that question more and maybe mm. that's surprising that I haven't thought about that question but I yeah mm. I I don't I don't know if that would be I don't think that that would be beneficial to me maybe to think about that mm. or to dwell on that whole experience anymore that makes sense yeah uh, I part of the reason I ask is I think this is a tension for me of uh and we've discussed this before, but I really, um, yeah, I really believe people are good. Like I, I, in fact, the way I put it is I choose to believe that people are fundamentally good and also yeah. choose to believe that the universe is fundamentally good. And that's very important to me. And I yeah. almost, um, would choose it to the point of like belligerence and stubbornness where like, even if it was like false, I would still choose it or something, if yeah. that makes sense. Or, um, there's compelling evidence that it was false. I would choose it anyway. And I, I'm also aware of sociopaths and I've met sociopaths and I am th I'm very interested in sociopaths and what they are. And yeah. I don't think I actually still understand them very well, but, um, that's something I'd like to square where, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess hearing this, it seems like, oh, they're also fundamentally good and they have unmet needs that they're meeting through these like almost like peacocky strategies that are like incredibly yeah. elaborate and like quite harmful uh <laughs> like but uh most sociopaths are are seem very very clever and then it's like a you know you just knock it over <laughs> like, yes yeah. it's always a house of cards yes most sociopaths are not uh what's the word there's not a lot of depth happening. Well, this one's i mean the one you met seems like really funny yeah 
Yeah, it's almost comical when you see it in like a politician or like a businessman or like you're like, <laughs> like I know what you're doing. This is really funny. <laughs> I wonder how this is going to fall apart for you. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it, it's become a, a thing of like amusement rather than like a thing I fear now. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. It's, when you put it that way, I think I have pretty good boundaries. And so it's not really something I fear for myself. I'd be like, this is, no, you don't treat me like that. No, absolutely not. Um, but I'm interested. Yeah, I guess to be blunt, I'm interested in persuading people of this worldview that like people yeah. are fundamentally good and that the universe is fundamentally good. And I think this comes yeah. up for people. They're like, but there is but evil I've and I've been hurt. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, you really have. But I don't know how to square those. And um, that feels important to me. Yeah. Let me know when you figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to say that because I also am not really like it feels vulnerable to say that because I'm not. Um, how to put it generally I'm not interested in like I, I actually relate with what you said earlier about like I, I mean I don't know if I identify as a libertarian or, or not but like or, or if that's a the, as a philosophy is is or is I, I don't know I just don't think about it very much but like I'm not interested in like coercion and like forcing people but I, I don't know but I am interested in persuading people of this worldview <laughs> so <laughs> that's like an interesting asymmetry where it's like oh I wouldn't want to tell someone who to vote for or like where to live or like who to spend yeah. their time with but I'm like I, I think it's good for people <laughs> to believe that people are fundamentally good that the universe is yeah. fundamentally good and like I will die on this hill so I also think that that is a good thing to believe and that it adds so much joy and wonder to your life uh, yeah uh yeah what's that been like for you what's what's what been like like adopting that belief and worldview um what's your experience of believing that people are good and the universe is good and that sort of thing hmm. i don't know how to answer this question um <laughs> I, it, honestly it's now it's just the it's just the water that i'm swimming in in the mm -hmm. same way that that i grew up in this like fundamentalist christian worldview that was i didn't think a lot about because it was just yes. the water that i'm swimming in now the water i'm swimming in is just a different color uh -huh. that i like a lot more <laughs> yes. yeah i mean, I mean that's an easy i mean it's i imagine it makes you happy and that you're like oh yeah. i'm happy and i yeah. like the people i spend time with and how that's i spend right. time with them and <laughs> life is yeah. good that's right <laughs> yeah um Okay, to take a step back, like, how did you change practically, like, let me put this, when you decided to no longer be emotionally and financially poor, yeah. what caused that decision? And what did you do practically? Oh, okay. So the, the cause was the conversation of me having with myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I basically, uh, did you ever play with Legos as a kid? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I basically was like, okay, what are the traits that I admire in other people? Mm -hmm. um, what are the behavior patterns that I admire in other people? How can I learn those skills? Mm -hmm. um, and then literally made a plan to learn to be more of the things that I admired and to lose the parts of me that I didn't like. And, um, and then over the course of that process, found myself liking myself more and more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because I embodied and lived a life that was reflected these values and traits that I admired and didn't do these things that I didn't admire and felt poorly like were things that uh, poorly reflected on other people's characters. So obviously it did on mine too. And so it's just like a process of like falling in love with myself in a way that probably sounds weird, <laughs> but um, I had no sense of pride. Now I do. Mm. Um, and so the, the, like, practically it was, okay, here's the, the list of identifiable traits and what are the skills that, what are those skills that those traits are made up of, um, and breaking those down and then acquiring the skills that I lacked, uh, and to build, building my new Lego person mm. <laughs> that was made up of the, the colors that I liked. And didn't have the colors I didn't like anymore. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. What do you think it was that you admired about people who were like financially well off or wealthy or something like that? Um, oh, for the financial side of things, 
the what's the word hmm there's a there's an ability to make different choices like like a financial uh well-being is just a access to resources and res access to resources means you have more options available to make different choices and the life that i wanted to live was only possible if i had greater access to resources than i had at mm. the time um and so in order to be able to make those choices i had to to uh learn skills to get more money <laughs> mm -hmm. was was some of the the traits that were on that list and the, and as a prerequisite for that i was also like okay what's the kind of uh high paying skills that uh will also put me in uh the entertainment industry that also leverage things that i'm already good at so i'm having a head start um and what are the prerequisites for those roles and so like it was just a like here's the destination point and work backwards the whole way and so every every step along the way was pretty straightforward um ended up going back to school and got a degree in three years um and uh for the it, in the thing that made sense and like I literally just like scoped out here's what my life's gonna look like in three years and in five years and then just lived that life mm. yeah what skills did you have to learn practically to become financially more like in the direction that you wanted to go in like wealthy or uh, yeah so the most what's the word uh most people that get interested in like finance is a trap first of all uh, I know I tweet a lot about, or now I'm on threads, but I like post a lot about stocks and stuff because it's a equity research is fun and interesting to me. Um, the return on time is so low unless you already have a bunch of money that most people should not worry about it at all. Um, mm -hmm. And the the highest return on time are building practical skills that will allow you to to get a higher paying job. Uh, mm -hmm. like by far away exponentially higher um until you get to a level of where you're earning millions in a year you shouldn't like if you're just making uh economical decisions like the opportunity cost of caring about uh finance and public markets is s way high and and your your payoff likelihood is so low that just get better at <laughs> just get better at your job and advance into the career ladder um so I did, I had there were a whole set of like uh social skills that I didn't have that I needed to learn in order to advance up the career ladder the on the practical side I had to learn um a whole bunch of programming skills in a specific niches um I had to learn marketing more different kind of marketing skills um to be able to present myself as employable for this the specific role that I wanted as a like gateway into the role that I actually wanted um, and so there's a whole, yeah, what, what, what are concrete examples, um, animation skills, drawing skills. I took a whole bunch of art classes. Um, I developed, redeveloped, recultivated my habit of writing incessantly, um, to practice communication skills when other people weren't available to talk to I would have conversations with myself that sounds probably weird no nope. um sounds awesome <laughs> <thank> <laughs> it was very fun i enjoy uh -huh. the, i enjoy the process of, of sucking at things i think i've mentioned this before mm. uh -huh. <laughs> um and then i had to hold their whole software suites to do things that i didn't even know existed before that i didn't learn about until like several steps through the process yeah, there's a whole bunch of like hard and soft skills that were all like really all of the like first step stuff were pretty immediate to me after having that conversation with myself. And then going through that, everything like became more and more obvious as time went on and I got further on. Hmm. I'm going to take a second to go meta and then I want to ask yeah. a very specific question after that, which is sure. I'm realizing uh, in a certain way um uh there's several things i want to say here i think the things that i'm most interested in or one of the things i'm most interested in 
in these kinds of conversations is how someone's life and their views and their choices and what they're doing with their life is like very different from mine. Like you've yeah. lived a very different life than I have. And like, yeah. I can get like a lot from hearing from you like, oh, wow, you can live like that. And it sort of both expands my theory of mind of like how people work and what it's like to be other people. And yeah. it also really expands my options of what's available to me because I can be like, oh, yeah, you can live like that. And so um, I'm realizing that's part of the reason I'm most interested in. Um, well, one, I, I've never been like extremely poor and I've also yeah. never been like feeling like, oh, I know a lot about markets or finance or money, like kind of I mean, I grew up middle class and like. Um, my frugality was a virtue and that my mom yeah. was really instilling and like it was kind of like just toe the middle line like don't be too poor don't be too wealthy like that was the implicit message and um, I have my own relationship to money now that I, feels good for me but it like the financial situations that you've been in both being like extremely poor and then like having the sense of agency with money is those are both ones that uh, I don't quite feel familiar in and so I'm curious about that yeah. and um I wonder, yeah, so that this is where my practical question comes in of like, can you tell me more about, yeah, maybe for starters, like what's interesting to you about investing it, learning about stocks and, and markets and stuff like that? You said like, oh, most people shouldn't do this, but it's interesting for me. Well, what's yeah. interesting for you about that? Okay. I will, <laughs> I have a story for you, Todd. Yes. Oh, I love it. Your stories are great. <laughs> Thank you. So in uh, December of 2019, mm. At this time, I am in my second year of university. I'm living in an apartment complex. Down the street from me, there's a guy. Uh, his name's Kenneth Freeman. Love <laughs> you, Kenneth, if you're listening to this. Um, and Kenneth is in his 70s. He is a prolific Wikipedia editor, the most well-read person that I've probably met with the exception of maybe David Friedman. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like This man just was a walking encyclopedia. Um, and could have a conversation with you about uh, very nitpicky things about uh, Jewish history or uh, communist writings in the 60s in uh, Colombia or like it, this man just was a wealth of knowledge about anything and you walk into his house and every wall is covered in books almost floor to ceiling it's just books and you could go into any room in his house and you could point to a book and he, you don't even have to tell him the title. He already knows which book you're, you're pointing to. He knows the author. He knows the year that it was published. He knows the entire thesis of the book and could recite it, like explain it to you. Yeah. Not only does he know that that book, he knows every book that's like referenced in this book and that this person, what's going on culturally at the time, why the person wrote the book, who they're responding to, who their like uh, uh, opposition view is at the time. Like, the most incredible thing. So I would just have conversations with this person all the time. <laughs> and like, whenever I had time with talking to Kenneth is always a blessing. And Kenneth comes over to my house uh, just before Christmas. And I uh, knocks on the door and I answer the door and Kenneth's like, hey, Astrid, how, how are you doing? And I was like, life's good. How are, how are you doing? He's like, good. Have you heard anything about what's going on in Wuhan? And I was like, what's going on in Wuhan? I was like, isn't, that a, isn't that a city in China? Wow. And, and he's like, yeah. Have you been paying attention to, to the news recently or anything? I was like, I don't watch the news. No, like, why? You know this about me. Why would you? Why are you asking me this? He's like, oh, well, I don't know. I've just been noticing some things that don't really make sense. Um, and, uh, I think, I think it's worth paying attention to. And I was like, okay. He's like, yeah, I, I think that this might be the most important thing that happens in my lifetime. And I was like, whoa, hold a second. <laughs> you went from, went from this might be worth paying attention to this, that this is the most important thing that you've ever witnessed in your life. What is happening? What's going on in Wuhan? <laughs> and he's like, just, um, I just want you to let you know that, um, if you ever, if you need anything, just like, don't, don't hesitate to let me know. I've got like, I just got back from Costco. I've got like re my, you, you know, that spare room, it's like full of, of beans and dried goods and toilet paper and hand sanitizer and masks and gloves and like, whatever you need, just let me know. And I'm like, okay, so this is the most important, you haven't even told me what the thing is yet. First of all, it's happening in Wuhan, China. It's the most important thing that's ever happened in your life. You've lived through the like Vietnam War, uh, the Korean War. Like, 
what, what? And 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 also now you're stockpiling dried goods and like preparing for some kind of uh the need for a lot of hand sanitizer and toilet paper and i was like okay i have no idea what's happening but suddenly uh, it matters to me what's going on in wuhan china (laughs) (laughs) and so he he leaves and um also he still hasn't spoiled what's going on in wuhan china just that i need to figure it out um so he goes back to his house and I'm like, okay, I need to know what's going on. What's going on in Wuhan, China? I don't even know where Wuhan is on a map. Um, and so I fit, turns out uh, that Wuhan, the entire city had been shut down. And I was like, how's, how's this, what do you mean that I'm reading this stuff on uh, sources on the internet that I'm like, how, how the entire city has been shut. What does this mean? Like, they're literally stopping people from going in and out of the city at like every major transit site. And they're like, okay, this is very odd. This doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. Like this only makes sense if there's some kind of like highly contagious thing. And then I'm starting reading these cases about this uh, flu like thing that's airborne and it's, you know, can't control it. And I'm like, oh, now I understand. Okay. Uh, this makes more sense why you're stocking up on masks and hand sanitizer and things. This guy comes back to my house uh, like a week later. This time he's not, not a week later. He comes because it would have been the first or second week of January. He comes back to my house. He's like, and he's wearing a mask and he's wearing gloves. He's wearing like two masks and gloves. Uh, January, 2020, like the new, the news media is still not even talking about, it's not even called COVID yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he, and uh, he shows up to my house and he's like, so I assume you you figured out what's like going on, and I was like, yeah, it's like I think you might be onto something here, kid. <laughs> and and he's like, yeah, I think it's uh already in the U.S. and it has been for a while now. We just haven't authorities haven't publicly announced it yet, so that's why the mask and like the gloves and um yeah, I just wanted to reaffirm like if you need anything, let me know. <laughs> and and um also I like. Uh, I think this is, I think this is, I think this is the most important thing to ever happen in my life. So I've started a Wikipedia page on it. Um, and if you wanted to help me out, let me know. So this man literally starts the Wikipedia <laughs> entry on what, what the time was called the, uh, what was it called? The Wuhan virus or something. I forget the original name for the page, but now it's like, you know, the COVID-19 Wikipedia page. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and, but this just, this happened to be my neighbor <laughs> that was like, the guy that was tracking this uh in the US like before anybody else uh because he likes to read a lot and couldn't make sense of what was going on and so started publicly documenting a timeline of things and so now there's now we have an internet timeline that he made mm-hmm. of everything that led up to eventually like the lockdowns in the US and globally and and like that yeah so that's that process when when he came to my house the second time in uh, early January, and uh, we both at that point were like, "Yeah, this is a this is a worldwide pandemic. Like already, this isn't this is, nobody's talking about this being anything, but like we're at, we're about to go through something crazy that we haven't seen since 1918, <laughs> mm-hmm. and we have no idea what the world's going to look like." Um, and his his like motivating thing was, "Yeah, this is the most important thing to ever happen in my life." Uh, he he felt like his purpose on earth was to document this thing. Hmm. I felt like this is the biggest opportunity I've ever seen in my life to make a bunch of money. Hmm. (laughs) And so I realized I have, I don't have the skills to make a bunch of money. I need to understand what's going on in financial markets because nobody's talking about this, which means that it can't be priced in anywhere. So how can I make a bunch of money from uh this and what are the what are the consequences for second third fourth order going to be um so that i know to make money on the first make money on the second make money like how do i make as much money as possible from this um and that question led to me realizing i'd have no conception of how to even begin thinking about that um and led to me reading a whole bunch uh and the end result of that was me going ah okay they're gonna lock they have they're there's no other model the first model was lockdown so they're gonna do lockdowns here what's the consequence of lockdowns gonna be it's gonna be immediate recession which means that the response to the recession is gonna be printing 
an inflating currency at a worldwide scale that we've never seen in human history before, uh, because it's going to be every single country on earth at the same time. And they're going to be giving the money to people to try and stimulate the economy, which means people are going to be at home with nothing to do and lots of money that they suddenly don't know what to do with. So it's like consumer goods and speculative assets. So repiled my life savings into Bitcoin because I figured that was going to be the first thing to run up because people are bored at home. And then Robinhood came out and suddenly everybody was invested in the stock market and would use that to buy cryptocurrency. And I was right. And went up to like 10 X. Um, and then I was noticing things happening in the, in various commodity markets that was like, ah, well now the price of oil is going to collapse. It collapsed. And then the price of every oil asset was trading. Like we were never going to open back up again. Um, coal did the same thing. And then there was a whole like series of arbitrages that were really easy and obvious to me, at least at the time for just about every commodity market, because every commodity market suddenly was getting priced like uh, it didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the prices of assets was going down 80% and then other prices of assets were going up like thousands of percent in a week um, just because everything was shut down. And so nobody could get resources in a place because global shipping was shut down. And like, that's not a thing that we'd ever experienced. Um, in world history before and and so tracking literally at one point and i had like uh i was all constantly tracking every ship that was uh had a gps signal on earth just like where is it going what's their cargo who are they what company owns it who are they delivering to who's dependent on this later on the supply chain and like bringing this all out was possible for a person and sitting at home on a computer <laughs> um and so then then it became a Oh, great. Well, now I need to own shipping companies because we're going to have a supply or we're going to have everybody ordering all these consumer goods are going to, we're going to get stuck because we, the ports of Los Angeles have not, have not been designed to take this much stuff at the same time once shipping opened back up. And then, yeah, we had those huge, like hundred uh, plus ships waiting off the coast of Los Angeles. And then all of those companies made a bunch of money, which is the exact opposite that the market was pricing in was that they were going to lose a bunch of money, but those people didn't understand how shipping market uh, prices worked. And so like, there was just a whole series of arbitrages that felt really obvious once I learned enough to figure out what was going on and could kind of see the next thing. And so that's how I got interested in public equ equities and finance stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of one of those arbitrages so that I understand how that worked? Yeah, so this is a, a really concrete one. Um, so there's this company called Zim, uh, which is a shipping company. And they uh, own a, a, what's the word? A few ships, but primarily they're an operator of ships. So if you're a company that wants goods shipped from place A to place B over boat, but you don't have a crew, you will pay Zim to crew the ship for you, and then they will operate it to go from here to there. Um, and you're paying the uh, a fixed price for the crew to to play to to operate the ship would be what most people would assume how that pricing model is. But actually, the pricing model was something more like uh, the uh, Zim was paying, uh, what's the word? A, what's the word? Is Zim was actually paying the companies to, to, that they were operating the ships on. So it was the exact inverse. And then for, if the price is of shipping rates were higher for us, for delivering a certain goods, then all of that extra money on top of the, the price that Zim has paid to rent this ship to go from here to there. Are, are money that Zim gets to keep, you know, and it's it's profit for the company um, above the cost of labor. So for a period of time, if you had the view that shipping rates were going to go up a lot, Zim had already contracted out that we're going to be operating these certain lanes. And then when the view, when the the price that they got paid for doing that service went up a lot, they made a whole bunch of money. And the the time that this company IPO'd and the situation that the, the company went public was also kind of weird um, because the the person that owned the company or the, the the folks that were the primary shareholders 
basically were like price insensitive. They were just trying to get it publicly listed so that they could sell a bunch of shares because um, they, for whatever reason, didn't want the asset anymore. And so it was not getting, it was not appropriately valued already. Plus then if you had the view that shipping prices were going to go explode higher, uh, the company was going to do really well. And so what it ended up happening is the company went public at like twelve fifty a share or something like that. Um, and over the course of the next 18 months returned like $40 in dividends to the shareholders just because of how much money they made. So if you bought any time uh, initially after the IPO, you basically arbitrage that whole and got all the more than like three X your money back in a mm. very short period of time. Mm. That's like an example of a, a kind of arbitrage. There are other, other kinds of arbitrage um, that are more like physical arbitrage where for a period of time when the price of oil went negative, if you had the ability to take delivery of oil, you could basically, um, people were paying to get rid of their obligations to take delivery of oil. But that's what they, people mean when they say the price of oil went negative. So because we ran out of places to put oil, <laughs> if you had the ability to take delivery of oil, people were paying to get rid of their obligations to take delivery. And so if you took delivery and then you just uh, waited to sell the oil, you uh, made an immediate profit. So that's kind of another example of uh, more concrete arbitrage. And I assume you did not have the ability to take oil, but that you did have the ability to purchase Zim stocks. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah. Um, why did you start tracking certain investments publicly on, you have like a GitHub page that I you do. share certain investments. Can you tell yeah. me about that? So once the the craziness in commodity markets uh, ended, I wanted to to have a public record uh, for myself to like, here's some other ideas that I have. And I want to figure out if I am have a knack for this or if I just had a, a unique foresight at a very odd situation in history that I benefited from, um, which I think is probably much more likely the case that I... It was in a straight I was in a very odd fortunate position to to be able to benefit from a whole uh, bunch of things going screwy in in the kinds of markets that are very interesting to me and because I get and very easy for me to get lost in the details of things and other people tend to gloss over them and that was like where all of the arbitrage stuff was in the details for a period of the like three years <laughs> um, and so when that ended then I was like okay now I need to see outside of things going crazy. <laughs> Do I have an act for this or not at all? Uh, and so that's what started the, well, I'll, I'll start publicly tracking this. Um, so the the GitHub is not a perfect representation of the, the stuff that I own. Um, and a, a lot of my largest positions on there are still encrypted because I don't want to influence the price of things because I've developed a, a bunch of people that start following me mm. shadow, and shadowing me into things, which is, uh, I don't want to end up in legal trouble for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, anything that's like below a certain size, I don't even uh, put on there, but sometimes I'll encrypt it and then put it like a year or two later um, with the, the decrypt hash so that folks can see that I'm not making up. Yeah, I, this was the thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like a public record for myself to see to, just sticking to public equities. Um, is this a thing that I have an act for or not? Why why make it public? I don't know. It's more fun. It's more fun. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, uh, do you have a sense? Like, how is that going? Do you have a sense of whether, um, you, like you said, you probably, you just had, you were in a weird situation at a weird time, yeah. but maybe not. Like, do you, if you had to decide now, like, is that what you would decide that? Or... So if you take the, like the stuff on my GitHub and you have an equal weighted portfolio that just gets split every time that I add something new to it. Um, that is something that I track and that's underperforming like the S&P 500 mm. by like almost 10% actually. Mm. Um, if you weight the portfolio according to more of what I have actually weighted in my portfolio, then you end up slightly outperforming the S&P 500. Um, so what does that mean to weight it differently? Yeah, so if I buy to wait, if I have 10 stocks in my portfolio and I and I have 10% of 
my my total dollars that I started uh, with to put into each company, that would be an equal weighted portfolio. Uh -huh. And if I, instead of putting 10% in each, say I put 20% in this one and 15% uh, in this one. And so then I only put 5% in these ones over here. That's not equal weighted. So um, if you weight them according to how you're actually invested, then you are out, outperforming the S&P 500. Right. Yeah. I see. Not, not by very much, um, uh -huh. but there are a few arbitrage opportunities um, that happened this year related to the Bitcoin ETFs going public that mm -hmm. are basically account for all, more than all of it. Basically, I'm would be underperforming except for those arbitrages, which mean that I'm now significantly outperforming. And that would mean that like one in ten of your bets is pretty good then. That's, that's like meaning, and that's that's, a, that's meaningfully that good returns. Yeah, yeah, like that's a good batting average in investing. That's, no, that's basically what that means. Is uh -huh. that my one in ten ideas are really good that uh -huh. over, overwhelmingly make up for all of my really bad ideas. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. 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 Interesting. Hmm. Is there anything else about this topic that you'd like to say more about? Um, if you're interested, pursue your curiosity. If you're not interested, don't force yourself hmm. uh, and just make more money at your job. Hmm. <laughs> I'm curious to, to see how you do. Place. Yeah, so am I. I'm more <laughs> curious than anybody. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, mm, Yeah, I think I'll pause there for now. Is there anything that you'd like to talk more about or that you'd like to um, ask or share or anything else? Uh, no, I want you to lead with your curiosity. <laughs> and if there's nothing that's immediately mm. jump, jumping out to you that you haven't already asked me, then uh, we can mm. pause there. I mean, I am very curious about, um, I mean, there's there's many things I could ask about, but I think the one that's most salient is like, one that I've sort of already asked, but I, I do think there's more here to talk about and it's worth talking yeah. about, which is just like, yeah, seeing the good in people. And um, we talked about this in a private conversation previously, but about like meta and loving kindness. And yeah. um, I'd really love to just hear anything else that you'd like to say about that and your experience yeah. of that. So I, well, I fell into this um, by accident through historical research because mm -hmm. my uh, curiosity about various kinds of liberalisms uh, led me to trying to find like, what is the first worldview philosophy that I could meaningfully include in a in an umbrella of liberal worldviews. Uh, and the earliest written record that I came up with was Taoism and the, the Tao Te Ching and uh, the writings of uh, Zhuangzi and Lao Tzu and the reading their writings led me to go, oh, this is a just a strictly superior way, <laughs> like worldview in several uh, meaningful ways to the one that I had prior to ex my exposure to those thinkers. Um, Can you and, say more about that? What yeah. what seemed superior? So the, what's the word? The, the frame of, so it, 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 now, now, modern fr framings of uh, liberalism, um, especially in the era post Scottish enlightenment are focused on like this idea of rights. And you, uh, because you have the ability to act, you have the right to act is kind of like the line of thinking in, in some variants in others, it's like a legal variant. Like the, the English variant would be like, you have this legal right that we established uh, that this, this person had infinite rights, you know, because they had access to God or or authority. Um, and that authority comes from various places, either like it's the will of the people or the will of the important people or the will of the smart people. Um, they placed authority in this person to give you the, these rights and um, those rights grant you freedoms. Um, and this like is it uh, the the Taoist early Taoism is complete? It has nothing to do with this. You still end up at the same place at the end, though, where you have the early Taoists that are completely against the divine right of kings. They're saying like, no, actually, states were invented to control people and steal things from people while giving plausible moral deniability, but it's all made up. <laughs> and they invented an entire world history that's literally not true. Uh, in order to justify their own existence and steal from people and kill people 
and feel good about it. And like, wow, that's what a crazy thing to say, like hundreds of thousands of years before the enlightenment and in a totally different context. Um, and the way that they get there has nothing, it doesn't have anything to do with rights. It's just the universe exists and it's good and has a natural flow. And you can, uh, through training, like get in touch with this flow or, or lose this sense of flow. And when you, when you disconnect from the universe, uh, and, or you try to intentionally impede the flow of the universe, your, your efforts are going to be futile because it's like water is just going to power you away. And, um, who are you to, to stand against the will of the universe? Um, and this, and the, this kind of like explains all of the like social ills that, that, um, nowadays what we would call like conservatives talk about, um, like social conservatives. Uh, and that all of these are actually a result of people trying to control other people um, and people trying to control the the direction of the flow of the, of the natural state of things. Um, and it was, it like blew my mind that you could get to this like screeds against the divine right of kings and um, the same place of like, actually the great evils of the world are taxation and punishments and war um and guilt and i was like well, how do you get there from the universe has a flow <laughs> <laughs> and and um i i just found myself like self continually as i went on in uh my readings and thinking i just kept coming back to this this idea of uh wu wei of this um and find it find it a more what's the word Hmm. It's more salient to me for some reason that I don't know how to, to put to words. Um, but it's awfully convenient for me that it puts me in the same place that I had the same conclusions that I had before in a, just a different way. Uh, Do you have a sense of how they got there? Of how you get from yeah. there's a flow to there. Uh, so let's see. So it starts with like Lao Tzu saying there is this flow, uh, and Zhuangzi kind of expands on this and says that like the the things that stop the the flow of the universe, uh, or are the um th these like acts of resistance, um, all start from this place of people with like good intentions, um, and that people with good intentions are actually the most dangerous force on earth because they have the arrogance to think that they can stop this flow. Um, and they will try in thinking that this is a better direction for things to go. And in so trying, they create all of this, the these social ills. Um, and the, the, that gets expanded on again by, um, what's the word, uh, Powell. And he basically takes it all the way to the conclusion of like, oh, actually, the people that are putting up the most resistance are the people that are trying to control other people through the state. Um, and so you end up with this whole like anarchist uh, line of philosophy. But it's like it each like step along the way, you it like makes sense of the expansion of this this idea of flow to this idea of resistance to the putting up a resistance and trying to manipulate other people or control other people or the universe around you is like stop something and you'll end up with such a force that you get overwhelmed and it destroys you to the people that are doing this the most or the people that are trying to control and morally justify themselves. Like it's, it all kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's my, my, my stumbling into the worldview of people are good and the universe is good huh. just came from me reading history and pursuing my own curiosity. <laughs> what did that look like for you to adopt those views? What did that look like? Did uh, anything practically change in your life or did you relate to people differently? How did that show up? Yeah, it's more just a... What's the word? It's a, just a shift in perspective. I feel like I was already on this path, mm -hmm. um, and that it just gave a different 
words for the things that I was already believed or the things that I already was noticing. Um, but I still don't find uh, my default are still like the, like I, because I grew up in this like Western canon, my, the words that I use when I'm talking to most people are still the, uh, that frame. Um, yeah, I don't know how to answer this question. It's a good question. Hmm. I want to ask more about this, but I'm just sitting with uh, what it is I can feel in my body. So, mm. can you tell me a story of a time since you adopted these views or like? that became more conscious, um, like a social interaction that you had that seemed different because you believed this? Oh, yes, I can, but I don't want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yeah. Mm. Um, I had been, we both were at Vibe Camp and the, mm. my, my experience of the first Vibe Camp was very, uh, would have been very different if I didn't have this uh, view. Mm. Yeah. Do you practice metta? Yes. Mm -hmm. What's that like for you? Uh, it's an all the time thing. It's mm -hmm. like me doing dishes, and <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's happening to like, oh, it's it's so lovely to like love yourself while you're doing <laughs> the dishes, <laughs> and or or if you had uh, dinner with like somebody recently over to like to intentionally send love to them as you're like cleaning up after. Um, I don't know, it's just like free, uh, free dopamine, oxytocin, good chemicals all the time. I don't know, uh -huh. just highly recommend. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, 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 um, people notice also, like I, um, if you just like walk down the street and you're practicing meta, like people come up to you and talk to you mm. and, uh, want to, like they feel compelled to, it's like, it's really weird, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's also very pleasurable. And, um, yeah, it's just brought so many lovely people into my life that I otherwise wouldn't uh, have. Yeah. I'm juxtaposing what you just said with what you said earlier about like how you really wanted to learn this skill from this woman about like yeah. presence. And uh, I wonder how you make sense of that sort of thing now, either the presence that this woman had or like the fact that people want to talk to you because you do meta, like, yeah. how do you understand that now? Yeah, the, what's the word? The, the like skill of developing presence is a totally, uh, hmm, maybe, maybe it's not the way that I would actually describe what was she was actually doing she's like putting on a character mm -hmm. in the same way that you do when you're performing uh for a, a camera or when you're uh putting on a play and like she was living in that character and how would that character move and how would that character speak mm -hmm. um in order because her living as that character got her the thing that she wanted um and so it, like she was present with herself um and through that, like it had the this like illusion of being present with the other people, but it was all uh, paper. It wasn't real. Um, there wasn't any there there. Like, and that was became it, like you could literally see her turning it off or turning it on, like mm -hmm. at will. Um, and the my experience of interacting with other people who practice loving kindness is a very different experience you don't see a turning off you, mm. it's just always on mm. and it's and it becomes easier the more that you do it and so it to the point where it like requires no effort or focus or and it's just the natural default state of things and 
that that's a very different place to be in and and uh yeah. I have very different behavior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that too. Yeah. But but like as a side consequence, you also get this sense of presence that like people can feel that's tangible. That like I said, literally you'll just walk down the street and people like feel it on you. Yes. And they'll and they smile at you and they mm -hmm. laugh and they talk to you and they want to know how you're doing. And like that probably sounds insane if you've never like had an experience of like you, when you go outside if people don't come up to you and want to know how you're doing that you've never met before then like try meta <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I know how I would teach meta to someone but I'm curious how you would teach meta to someone if who is interested oh, man. I have no idea I've never mm. even thought about mm. the I think my what's the word it um Hmm. I am not an evangelical about this. Mm. I feel like the uh, the people who know that it's for them know and will find it. And mm. I don't need to have a hand. Um, and I, because of the life I've lived, feel much more apt to help people through other problems, blockers, um, mm. and have other things to teach that I have intentionally practiced getting better at teaching. Hmm. Um, so I will leave Meta to, to you and others. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yeah. Part, part of the reason I ask is sort of curiosity about it in a like pedagogical way, because that is my job and uh, I, to help other people to learn how to do this technique, but also yeah. part of the way I practice it is that there's always more love available, both to perceive and to act from. And yeah. um, when I interact with you, I'm like, ah, Astrid knows things about love that I do not. So I wish oh, to learn these from you. Yeah. That is the highest compliment. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Is there something you can tell me about love? <laughs> <laughs> I am sure there is. And I also don't know it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's how this usually goes. It's also so simple and it's just, yeah, I don't know. Uh, hard to put words to. So yeah. I want to ask about the world right now. And um, I don't know, over here, I think that it seems like this is an interesting time that we're in. It's a different time than the pandemic and uh, all that. But I'm curious how you sense this moment in time and what's happening right now. Yeah. Hmm. I'm not so sure I know how to answer this in a general sense, but mm -hmm. I think about this in a, a relative sense almost every day because mm -hmm. uh i live in this this kind of bubble and the the people that i've picked to be in my life um have very similar what's the word they're, they're all there's this like sense that there's they're all there's a lot more anxiety in like my among my friends and the people that i spend time with than usual um and there's a lot of, what's the word? There's also a lot of excitement. Um, the, I'm trying to not use judgment words <laughs> intentionally. Um, but I, yeah, what's the word? We live in a time of a lot of cults. Mm. And I know that's a judgment label word, but there are a lot of... Um, I feel what what's the word for most of my life I underestimated the power of story and now I see it everywhere and I see it dominating people's thoughts and habits and worldview um it, to the point where they're uprooting their entire lives for a story that they're telling themselves um that has no relationship to the world's mm -hmm. um and I, this is a recurring pattern that I see uh, among my friends that is worrying to me. Hmm. But one of the skills that I'm interested in learning that I don't feel very good at, but it seems like you have is like keeping a 
pulse on the world as a whole, like being aware of what's happening. And, um, you know, that does involve knowing things about like markets and politics and history and, you know, basically anything you can get your hands on, like your friend Kenneth <laughs> has just like yeah. books on everything and knows everything. It's like, uh, yeah. Is there anything you'd say about that skill or set of skills? I mean, it's obviously so open-ended, I know, but anything yeah. that comes to mind. It's, it feels like a, it's a fun hobby. If it's not fun for you, then don't do it. But I, hmm. that's my just life generally. <laughs> <laughs> like do the things that you enjoy, you know. Yeah. Um, the things that I enjoy have led me to a place where I pay more attention to global geopolitics than most people. And uh, for most people, that's probably not a thing that would add joy to your life. And so you shouldn't do it. Mm. <laughs> but if it would, then that's fine. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's my, my, my like view of the world is also through a series of filters and it's mostly through relationships with specific people. So I have like a relationship with a specific person who pays attention to the global lumber market, mm. another specific person who pays attention to soda ash, <laughs> like another specific person, or it's a couple few persons who pay attention to like global shipping and they all have very different views of what's going on in the world mm. um, and have very different things to say about it, but they're, they all edify my life. And um, yeah, I love them. Uh, most, people's exp most people who want to care about the world and what's happening go to news rather than going to a people mm. and hearing like from a person what's going on, what the, the things that they're seeing. Um, and I like my, I like getting my filter through people, um, rather than through media, which I'm getting at secondhand media, mm. <laughs> but, uh, it's not my, my, the, the things that I get to hear about aren't usually depressing. Mm. Yeah. What makes you trust someone to go to them about something? That is a great question. And I don't have an answer. Mm. Um, sometimes I have, I could have an answer on specific people. Uh, but as a general rule, I'm just following literally my gut. Of mm -hmm. this yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good answer. I, That's a good yeah. answer. That's a good answer. Um, hmm. Hmm. Well, I appreciate that you've uh, answered so many of my questions about so many topics. I also appreciate <laughs> your stories. They were delightful. Uh, Thank you. As I said, there's very different life experiences than you've had that, that you've had than me. So I get to uh, really, that's a treat and a privilege to hear about your life and this everything you've been through. And um, I really feel honored to hear about them. And I hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed this time as well, friend. I did. I mm. did enjoy this time. Thank mm. you. Mm. Yeah, I, I very much... Uh, was looking forward to it and I am not have not been disappointed with my return on investment. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Excellent. It was a good investment. We had to put that in the GitHub. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh.